And we are live. Tonight we're joined with Apocryphal 1970, Robert Farrell, going through the keys to the kingdom, the hidden parabolic language, all in the Book of Thomas. I'm the Limitless Channel, Ronnie Harris, with Jason. This is the Awake Souls YouTube channel. How you doing, brother? I'll introduce you, and then you can let everybody know that Robert's with us. Well, I'm doing great, great. I'm happy to be here, happy to share. Awesome, awesome. It's a, it's a great having you uh, with us. I, I had the audio still going. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't hear it, we didn't hear it. But um, yeah, it's it's great to have you here, Robert. We wanna we wanna go through these these keys of the kingdom. We think it's super super important. Uh, it's something that Ronnie and I have been talking about for a long time. But I know that you're super instrumental in this because because Ronnie was following the work that you've done. And so there's there's nothing better than having you on here to talk about it because you really sort of led the way on this. Well, and again, I'm glad to be here. I think I think the 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 overarching um, I think truth about the scriptures is that is that um, that they're alive and that they're living and that they're uh, they're there to uh, sort of help us through the age until we get to the finality, if you will, of the age. And that that there there are stages of revelation: a first stage, a second stage, and then a the third and basically final stage of revelation. And that we are right there on the cusp of that third and final revelation. Uh, I believe that there that there are patterns and imagery throughout the scriptures, the Old and the New Testaments, and also in these books, these books that are sometimes called lost or forgotten or whatever, what they are is they've been marginalized uh, and or destroyed, you know, variously. And um, because through the course of time, these things have come to us from out of um, out of volumes, out of uh, scrolls that have been found, out of things like jars, uh, out of monasteries, out of trash piles, just all kinds of different ways in which these books have come back to us over the years after having been burned and banned and destroyed and anathematized. Uh, sometimes uh, they're just they're just sort of marginalized or they they become academic or something. Um, but outside of say the 66 books of the say the Protestant canon or different churches have different things called canons, which are of course their lists of books from which they read and what they consider to be authoritative. Uh, and some religions are a little more liberal. They they see in terms of um, they're sort of like this uh, uh, this sort of other universe of, of books that are considered reliable or um, trustworthy, but not on the same level as say canon is. Not they don't hold that kind of authority, but they may be considered good to read. Uh, they may be somewhat popular among the people. So different cultures view these books sort of differently. Uh, in, in some uh, in some uh, denominations, for example, Catholic and Orthodox um, groups, some of these uh, books are called that are called apocryphal by um, by the Protestants uh, are uh, considered canon or even deuterocanon, which is added later to the canon. So there's already been sort of this precedent in some areas of the church where books have been added uh, or at least officially uh, sanctioned after a passage of time. And so this is kind of a similar thing, that there are books out there that are to be, um, to be held back until the time of the end and then restored to us at the time of the end. Uh, and the way in which these books are restored to us is through the understanding of these books. Um, up until now, uh, the various denominations have ruled by basically what amounts to a decree. Um, they, they get together and they agreed upon which books uh, were going to be considered authoritative and which books were not going to be considered authoritative. And that pretty much has, has been a settled issue in the church for a very long time. And like I said, there have been changes in this, in this paradigm over time, uh, where, for example, the Catholic Church uh, added the uh, books that we now call the Apocrypha in the Protestant Church. And then, of course, uh, the Protestant Church began sort of marginalizing these same books and uh, putting them in smaller print at first and then putting them, you know, at the end of the scriptures and just sort of getting people off of them, so to speak. So they sort of weaned us off of those things. And, you know, then, of course, they were removed from most Bibles and very few Protestant Bibles have Apocryphal books in them anymore. Uh, and so the... The, the thing about it is that God's word is not going to return to him void and that, you know, what he says will have its effect and that there's nothing that people can do. So the question is, if these books are to be returned to us, it sort of implies that there should be some sort of mechanism or some sort of way in which we can go back and re and recover these mysteries and recover these books. And the, the New Testament and the Old Testament, the New Testament is really filled with prophecies, most of them from Yeshua. Uh, the, the idea that... Um, that I will give you the words in that day that you will speak them and don't think ahead of time what you will say because those words will be given to you at that time. So in other words, it's going to come literally out of the blue. It's going to come literally as a revelation that, that somehow the right thing will be said and that will affect God's will. 
you so, know, and God's will, yeah, is that we should listen to his son. Right now, right now, as you're speaking to us, this wasn't like super prepared. You're just letting the, the Holy Spirit flow these these thoughts, this, this train right well, now, right? Almost, you almost can't help it. You see, when you understand something, you, you're, you're, you're lifted up in your mind. And there are a lot of things that are just, that are just scales and shackles that fall off and you become, uh, you become a different person. It's like you're, I don't want to say that you're born again, again, but you are transformed into, into a, a mind that can think beyond the, how shall I put it? The artificial limitations that have been set and the art, artificial foundations that, that the church has been built upon. Because see, this, this really strikes at the root, if you will, of the, the, the trees of, of their teachings or whatever. This really strikes at the root. And this is why we in the in the end times can be like Latter day John the Baptist, if you if you will. Because and again, these the people that are to come, they're, they're spoken of as the elect, they're spoken of as the children. This is the future generation, the third to whom the third revelation is given. These are the ones who get the teachings that, you know, like I said, that it comes to them, that it just happens. Um, and that that they just appear on the scene because it's time. You know, and through no particular other reason than through God's election, because that's kind of what the word means. So he picks and chooses who he pleases to give these met, the, these teachings to. And it's and it's given out, it's parsed out to different people. It talks about the very least in the kingdom of heaven will be greater than John the Baptist. And the reason why that can be true, and this is one of the um, the logins in this book, which is a book of riddles. It's a book of mysteries. It's a book of revelation and, and codes. And it does, it, 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 its function, I believe, and I, I hope to demonstrate on some level, it, the function of this book is to, is to get us to recognize the power that this book gives us and to utilize that power to overcome a false and outdated paradigm uh which again was because god has given space to wickedness and god has given space to evil he's given us ages just like the six days are given over to man the six thousand years are given over concomitantly to mankind it's 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 as above so below um you know and and these are universal spiritual truths they can be used and they can be abused this knowledge can be revelatory, or this knowledge can be taken and hidden and put away, and and it can be used to to unite people, uh, as well as to enlighten people. And uh, again, um, one of my contentions is because because you know this stuff at the end of time, right? You understand the mystery at the end of time, and because you're reading it, that means it was written then at the beginning of the church age and encoded at the beginning of the church age, and it has to be the very same mystery that you're seeing now. So now you've changed the foundations. You've gone back to the beginning and you've seen the beginning and therefore you see the end. Because again, if it's decoded, it was encoded. It was encoded then to be decoded now, right? And that validates the authority of these books. That validates the, the foundations upon which we can now build a heavenly kingdom, a heavenly um, city, if you will. Um, That's because, really, really well said. I, like the encode and decode is super important point we've ronnie and i constantly talk about the nature of this reality and that encoding and decoding seems to be a, a super important part of it well it, it is because well i mean again it's, it's sort of a proof in and of itself and this is one of the things where people will agree with me or people will disagree with me but i i, I try to keep a sort of laser focus on the interpretational aspects of scripture there are a lot of avenues that i could go down that other people are going down. Uh, but I like to keep my eye on the ball, so to speak, because this is something that in and of itself is worth pursuing. And I'll tell you why. Because because the, the way in which God's power um, uh, has effect on the world is that this is a written document, a contract with man, a covenant, if you will, between God and man, between heaven and earth, between the heavenly and the earthly, between this age and the age to come. Okay, so being the consummate if you will, lawgiver. He's doing things lawfully, orderly, and according to uh, jurisprudence, if you will. He's, he's ultimately, he speaks of himself that he calls the end from the beginning. So what he says will come to pass. And he's just emphatic about this. And that six days or 6,000 years are being given over to man. You ask, well, if there is a God, why is there evil? Well, again, because again, evil, the, the way in which the age has to play itself out, the, the mystery of iniquity has to play itself out in reality. Uh, is it, it, it has to come into being and it has to pass. Uh, in other words, if you think about eternal power and if you think about infinite power and you think about what lies beyond what you can see, there you, you can talk about the physical universe, but there 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 are these underpinnings to everything that in its physicality. There 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 are there are laws, if you will, of physics that perhaps are inherent in the material, but also transcend the material. 
In other words, in other words, the material comes into being, if you will, emanates from a universal. It, 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 it emanates from a great and powerful truth, which is beyond itself. It will, I like to say this, and I probably say it altogether too much, but it just hit me one day that it was just as simple as this. If you ask yourself, people ask a kind of question like, well, if God created the universe, who created God? Or, you know, the idea is kind of silly because because if you could, you could think in terms of if one plus one equals two, for example, right? You don't need a particular, you don't need one apple plus one apple equals two apples, or, or you don't need a, that particular, you don't need the material counterpart in order for this thing to be true in itself. You know what I'm saying? You don't need an apple to say that one plus one equals two. You know what I'm saying? It just it just is true. And so if you ask yourself, what is the nature of truth in and of itself? What is the nature of truth? It can have no beginning because you ask yourself the same question. When did one plus one begin to equal two? When will one plus one stop equaling two? And you say to yourself, well, that's a ridiculous question. That, that concept really can't have any real beginning and it can't have any real end. It can't really not be true. And so even a whole world full of people saying that one plus one is three, one plus one is always going to be two. And so it just can't, you can't touch that because truth is so powerful and so, and so far intrinsic, I guess, in everything. Uh, it's so inherently itself. Is that existential? Is that the right word? Existential? Well, it's, it's transcendental, I think. It's something which it transcends. It, you can't, I mean, again, I don't want to get too, you know, like out there but i mean just in terms of something that's true in and of itself and I, and the reason i'm emphasizing this is because i'm yeah you know, i'm trying to illustrate that in the bible there are things that are true in and of themselves um and so what i'm getting at is this is a message for the world this is a message for the the christian and it is also a message for the atheist all right it is for whatever denomination you're from it's true in and of itself and so i like to stick to things that are scripturally there so that even somebody from the outside and i believe this is god's design i, I believe that this is um, that this is something that, because he's presented us with his word, and it's true in and of itself, the very fact that, for example, like I was saying before, the very fact that you can now decode what was encoded, right? And then when you go back to what was encoded, it talks about how someday it will be decoded, and then you can decode it, right? The mystery will be lost and then found again. You see what I'm saying? So it comes full circle. That his word doesn't come back to him. Boy, he calls the end from the beginning. So if you can prove that on an existential level, in other words, you can, you can point out that this indeed is what this is, then then a person who is of another faith or a person who is of no faith at all or a person who is confused or a person who just doesn't know, it, it doesn't matter. It will be true in and of itself, just like one plus one equals two in and of itself. And it doesn't, it, the, the, the very fact that you can illustrate something and show something in and of itself demonstrates the wisdom and also becomes the fulfillment of the prophecy because a lot of these prophecies are about what happens when you come to discover and that's essentially where the book begins so that um it's about it's about finding uh this life through if you will knowledge and again some people will, and this is where this is one of these bones of contention with the scholars and with the lay christian alike uh is that people like to, to categorize and people like to, to pigeonhole things and, and put things into nice neat little context that they find uh palatable and agreeable and that makes sense according to human thinking but the way that this higher power thinks, the way that God thinks, the way that the, the author and finisher, if you will, of our faith, the one who begins things and sustains things and then brings things to a completion, the one who is all powerful, in other words, the one who has all knowledge, the one who has, has literally, uh, because, because existence could not exist without truth, and because he is truth itself and it encompasses all things and nothing encompasses him, and nothing can stand in his way because it literally it literally is dependent on him for its existence in the same way that you are dependent on him for your next breath and that, you know, your body metabolizes that breath or whatever is according to that design, you know, and again, that's something which, you know, evolutionists might debate or they might question, but this, this that I'm talking about has a sort of a literary aspect to it. One, which if you invited them to say, listen, you know, read this, like you're reading, you know, the Odyssey or read it like you're reading Huckleberry Finn or something. Let's look at the literary details and let's look at this algebraically. Let's look at this in terms of, in terms of that. Okay, so take everything and put it aside. I don't care how skeptical you are. The proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the very fact that if you understand a key and it unlocks a parable, then that key you can take over to from these, these non-canonical writings over to the canonicals and vice versa. You can take what you've learned from the canonicals and go back and open up these books with those same keys. And so they're consistent. So their consistency becomes one of these objective truths and um, their, their universality becomes a key to understanding. And this is why you can have an open canon versus a closed canon. 
you see, for a time when people don't understand, you have to put everything into a box. And you have to say, it's these books because we say so, because we agree. We got together and we decided that these were them. All right. And then this is what we did. And these other ones are, you know, outside of this box. And these other ones over here are beyond the pale. Those those got to go. You know what I'm saying? They, they've, they've set these, these boundaries based upon their understanding. Now, you can demonstrate that, that these interpretations are valid at the end and that you can decode them. Then you've also, by default, like I said before, just by default, if they are decoded, they are encoded. And so by default, you know the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end because the two are linked. And uh, so that becomes a proof, if you will, a demonstration of God's power that he does, in fact, transcend time. and does, in fact, transcend space. And so you have an actual tangible proof of this in his word. And so that's why, you know, I don't I don't typically go around to other peripheral issues or whatever, because this is so central. And it's so in my mind, it's so universal to, to human the, the transformation from us being in the state that we are in to to growing into our next phase, which is what we will be over the next thousand years. Uh, as we live here, we will live and reign with Christ. Now, what does that mean? It means that Christ will be in us. We will have the mind of Christ because the truth will have set us free. Uh, we will be clean and, and, and we will be called priests and kings because we will be we will be changed into something which is obedient to this truth, that recognizes this truth, that speaks and utters this truth, that acts upon these truths. We will ourselves become transformed. It is a necessity for us to change. And this shows us, this proves to us that this change is not only on the horizon, it's here and has always been here. That, that, that again, if you have this really strong beginning where everything is understood and written down, that means if you're reading Thomas and it pans out, if you're reading Peter and it pans out, if you're if you're reading Mark and Matthew and John and it pans out, that means that you know those books are reliable. So the idea of the open canon can can exist based on understanding and discernment, and that understanding and that discernment is when those mysteries are restored at the end of time. So to be able to articulate those things to point them out, uh, again, it is it is universal because it applies not just to the the, the, the people in the churches or whatever. It does apply to them. And, and, and as an aside, I sometimes wonder if those people aren't going to be the hardest to win over um, in, in some capacity because because the traditions are very rooted. I myself was an atheist at one point, a, a kind of a rabid one. I was kind of a, an obnoxious person, actually, thinking about what I was because I was just smart enough to be able to win an argument and, and just dumb enough to take the wrong side of that argument. I, and, I was in the exact same boat, Robert. I, I went through having grown up i grew up jehovah's witness and knew the scriptures really well and um and then like i don't know i was in like my mid-20s or something uh i just started looking stuff up and uh, the cognitive dissonance thing took over and i fell for like scientism real hard and so i flipped on on the scriptures i, I flipped on on all that stuff and became a rabid atheist for you know, probably a good 10 years <laughs> well you know I'll, I'll give it this there's a certain, there's a certain, I, I say this with quotes. There's a certain freedom, I think, in terms of, in terms of, um, in terms of being. I don't want to use the term. Well, I'll use it, being your own god, so to speak. Uh, thinking what you want to think, saying what you want to say. There, it, you know, there are no rules. They don't apply to me. You know, uh, and even if you have some level of integrity, like I sort of saw myself as an honest atheist. Like I really believed my own, you know, arguments. I really believed. That it was that I, my thoughts were that people were shackling themselves and throwing their lives away to religion. I really hated to see that happen to people. That I thought that people's minds were were constrained by these, you know, thousand years dogma, years. right? Yeah, and, and, and you know, you're doing things because you're told to do things. You know, when you have eyes to see and ears to hear and a mind to think, why aren't you using them? You know, and so that was sort of my attitude. So even even in my most obnoxious, you know, time, I was trying to wake people up. I was trying to pull them out of what I thought was a stupor and what I thought was blindness. You know, and I was trying to give them eyes to see. And so in a lot of ways, I'm still just that same person, but with a different message that I hope is more constructive and uh, that's more positive, if you will. And then it will apply to everyone. Um, but I mean, and again, you know, getting into what this book says, um, if I were to just stay start out um, reading it. Yeah, do you want to do it? Yeah, let me, yeah, let me, okay, so let me just start out by reading it. Now, first of all, just as an aside, um, I'm using this particular translation, and I think it's a, it's a good translation. Um, it may not be everyone's cup of tea, but what the, what the really good thing about this is, is that it's a public domain. 
And so I wanted to kind of give a shout out, first of all, to the, um, the author here who's made that, um, who's made that, um, hold on a second. <laughs> Turn that off. Um, but anyway, but you know, you can go to gospels.net and you can find a lot of these and hopefully you, you can use these, um, you know, to, uh, to help to, you know, popularize some of these books uh, once you start seeing it. Uh, so again, so I just wanted to make sure uh, that people know what the source is so that they can utilize it freely themselves. Um, but just again, um, like we spoke of last time, we went kind of over the prologue and it's kind of necessary to go over the prologue because again, it's really kind of what I've just been saying. Like what I was just saying is that with the, um, with the understanding that comes with uh, understanding the, the scriptures and understanding the mysteries that, that it, that it snowballs, if you will, that it, you grow and you live and you, um, and you mature. And in a lot of ways, I can testify that that's happened to me over the years. Um, you, you, you live and you grow and you, and you learn and it changes you as a person and it changes your perception and it makes you into uh, somebody with maybe a little more discernment than you once had. Uh, but you're able to articulate light and hopefully like, um, like you can light a candle with another candle, you know, hopefully uh, uh, this can kindle a lot of other people's um, fi um, fires, if you will, and uh, light a candle, if you will, for them inside uh, so that they can be a light. Uh, and so it starts out by saying that these are the hidden sayings which the living Jesus spoke and which did a most Judas Thomas wrote down. Um, and what's crucial here to understand, this is one of the very first things that, that, that he talks about is living there well, this is one of this is one of the great themes that runs through the gospel of thomas and most of the scriptures as well the living versus the dead and who are the living and who are the dead um if you are spiritually alive and you have spiritual eyes if you will if you have a spiritual um uh, sense uh, of how to read the scriptures then you become figuratively alive and this is contrasted with death see how it says uh, whoever comes to discover the meaning of these sayings won't taste death. So um, to, to come alive, I think you understand what is hidden. Um, and so the living Jesus, the living Yeshua, um, spoke things that were hidden um, to be, if you will, spoken in the light. Uh, and so that the sayings were hidden implies that they are meant to be, you know, uh, revealed. Uh, later and then it says, and that backs it up here where it says and whoever discovers the meanings of, of these sayings uh, won't taste of death so in other words tasting of death has to do with not understanding the meaning in other words they're still hidden from you and living um, has to do with discovering the meaning when you discover the meaning you become living you become alive uh, if you don't understand the meaning what you understand is death and so the the understanding of something on a superficial uh, fleshly level uh, constrains you uh, to a spiritual death. Uh, and again, living has to do with the spirit. Death has to do with carnality. Um, and again, this is this is this is spoken of in, in so many different ways. You almost have to preface it. Wealth versus poverty. The wealth is spiritual. The poverty is carnal. Um, the heavenly and the earthly. The heavenly is having that the, the other eye to see. You have the carnal eye, which sees the surface level of meaning. Uh, and then you have the spiritual eye that sees the spiritual uh, level of things. And so this book is kind of parsed out in just that way, understanding, you know, death versus life, upper versus lower, uh, light versus darkness. Uh, it's all kind of just different ways of saying the same thing. So it's, in a way, it's very simple because um, almost, almost all you have to do to really understand the spiritual nature of the scripture is to just sort of parenthetically see the word spiritual in front of everything. You know, uh, if you replace one eye with another eye, for example, so you're replacing the one eye, which is the car, the carnal eye with the other eye, which is the spiritual eye, or when you replace the one ear with another ear, that, that has to do with your spiritual uh, enlightenment. That has to do with your seeing things now in the spirit, hearing things now in the spirit, and then you replace a hand with a hand. Well, like hands is what you do things with, you know, that's what distinguishes humans from most other species is, is a, um, you know, the hand, the way that it's designed has allowed human beings to, to do works. Uh, and to create civilizations and so on and so forth. And so because of that, it has to do with your work. So when you replace the carnal, if you will, hands, the carnal deeds with spiritual deeds, spiritual works, right, and et cetera. So it becomes apparent what this book actually means. And so again, um, of, of all the gospels that we have to us in our time, uh, in our time um, 
the Gospel of Thomas sort of stands out as being, quote unquote, like the most legitimate, the most, the closest to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that we have outside of, out of, outside of the canon. Uh, the fact that it was discovered, um, you know, late mid-century, I'm sorry, mid-century, mid-20th century, 1945, I believe it was, in Nag Hammadi, uh, which is in Egypt, um, by some Bedouins uh, or whatever. And then, you know, it subsequently found its way back into uh, scholarship through the Nag Hammadi codices, and it was restored to us after nearly 2,000 years of it being lost, uh, sort of providentially sort of hints at the fact that, you know, it was meant to be returned to us just in and of itself. The, the story behind it is kind of interesting, too, because it's it's a little murky and their variants of it, but essentially it was an accidental discovery and that they were using these books literally for firewood, for kindling, uh, when somebody decided they might be worth some money and then they put them aside. And so it was really only because of that that we that we have this book uh, or any of the Nag Hammadi codices. Um, yeah, that is interesting that they were burning them, burning books maybe, and then they, they stopped and it was saved. <laughs> well, they didn't know. Well, they didn't know that they were, um, they thought they might be worth money. If you find an old book, let's say, and you got any kind of sense, you're dealing with something where you say, hey, this might be worth money. Let's go and check out and see how, you know, if this is worth anything. You know what I'm saying? And so that's how the book came back to us because they were they were using it to, you know, because again, you're, you're trying to make something on, on, the, on the on the stove or something and you're out there in, in, you know, the land of the Bedouins or whatever, you know, you're you're lighting something and putting it in. The, you know what I'm saying? They were they were doing this and it dawned on somebody that this might be worth some money or whatever. So they 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 shopped it around, I guess, and then it was sort of found that way. But it's it's very it's very fortunate for us that this book has found its way across time and through you know, the age to be restored to us because it is discernible and it is decipherable. And see, and that's the thing, um, after having read it, I don't know how many, probably hundreds of times I've read this book because I, I'll, I'll, I listen to it every day sometimes. Um, and it just, it's so comforting, I think, to me to know that I can articulate it to a certain extent. Um, but if, you, if you're following what I'm saying so far, you already sort of have eyes to see and sort of have ears to hear. And you can probably judge in yourself if this is making sense and if this is really uh, if, the, if, if, if this really is the payoff, because that's kind of what this is. Uh, it is sort of it, it is sort of the payoff. It is the it is the fulfillment, if you will, of these scriptures. Because again, the first thing it starts out saying is that whoever discovers the meaning of these sayings won't taste death. And again, this isn't a physical death; it's a spiritual death. You won't taste of that spiritual death anymore because that under the, the discovering of the meaning pulls you out of that death and brings you to life. So you become uh, living, if you will. So what was living got written down by Judas Thomas, and uh, if you discover it, then you come back alive. You no longer taste death. So again, and then he, it encourages you. He's, he's basically underscoring the fact that it is there and it is discernible. He says, whoever seeks should not stop until they find. When they find, they will be disturbed. And when they're disturbed, they will be amazed and will reign over the all. Now, again, if you're following what I'm saying, I'm talking about, I'm talking about that the ax has been laid at the root of the tree, so to speak. That foundation is built upon sand, if you will. Because the idea of the canon being a function of people's people's uh, a function of committees or of people's um, uh, you know arbitrary decisions, perhaps uh, or even educated decisions. I mean, if you give them even the the greatest benefit of the doubt, it still it still devolves into somebody made a decision as to which books were in and which books were out, and you weren't given those eyes to see the the inner meaning, and you weren't given those ears to hear the inner meaning, uh, and so. For nearly 2,000 years, that mystery was lost. And so, again, I go back to if the mystery is there, there's certain there's certain logic to this that this, that even I think, like I said, even an atheist or even an unbeliever or even just a, a regular uh, uh, you know garden variety Christian out there, they'd have to um, they would have to really kind of answer a question, you know, that if these things are decipherable, if they are decipherable, and that's what I really want to uh, to underscore is that they are decipherable and that that is translatable between one set of books and another. So what, what, what works in these books works in your books, you know, and, and what works in your books works in these books. There is this intercompatibility that I'm trying to demonstrate here, um, this, this oneness of purpose. And that, that functionally, what that does is it destroys the foundations upon which traditional Judaism and traditional Christianity, upon which those two things specifically rest. And also much of the, um, much of the argument, if you will, against Christianity and against Judaism um, rests upon the, the Christianity and the Judaism that was created by carnal people. And so without the ability to see the heavenly meaning, a lot of people's, it, it has to be revisited. It has to be looked at again with fresh eyes, I, I guess is what I'm trying to say, is that, is that all that has been written has no foundation. 
all that had been spoken that was built on that foundation has no ultimate validity insofar as that those assumptions are foundational to what they're trying to say, I guess is what I'm trying to say, if that makes any sense. It's like saying that, that volumes and volumes and volumes of theology based on the assumptions that, that, that this fleshly meaning, that this fleshly level, I guess, they're found on this fleshly level, uh, they, 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 they exclude, I guess, the mystery that, that was waiting, I guess, to be revealed at the end time. So just having that mystery basically nullifies all of the previous teachings and undercuts them because it is a superior teaching and it's superior because it was it was there from the beginning and it's superior because it 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 like i said before it encodes to be decoded if you can decode it that means there was an age at the beginning of the church where these things were known and these things were taught if you can decode it it was encoded so if you're reading it now and you get it and you understand it now that means that peter and paul and matthew mark luke and john and thomas understood these things and, and, and they had it centrally in their thought process to write these things down, to lay these things down, to plant these seeds that would come up in due time. So if they start coming up, that means that the whole thing is basically a demonstration that, that God has power over time and space and, and has the ability to, to call in the, the, the debts, if you will, uh, that are owed him. And that this, this world and that this age were thought through ahead of time. And, and not only that, but again, what I talk about as far as the trifold revelation, there being a revelation to Moses and to the, the Jews and, and that covenant that applied to them, that spoke of two things subsequent to them. They spoke of the coming of the son, the son of man, the suffering servant aspect. And this is, again, validated the road to Emmaus. Uh, Yeshua is talking to the people who are walking with him, and he speaks of, hey, listen, all these things that were written of in the Old Testament, they were with regards to me. All the stuff that you read in the Psalms, this was with regards to me. You know, he's on the cross. He's like, my, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The idea is that he is the fulfillment of those scriptures. So he is that fulfillment. But he further spoke of, and the Father, the teaching of the Old Testament, further spoke of a third revelation. Um, again, because, uh, you know, I, I bring this up in almost every everything that I do because it's, it's very simple and easy to see and it's very foundational. The idea that there, the, the Ark of the Covenant that had three symbolic items in it. You have this, this box, which is overlaid with gold. And which is carried about by men and that contains within it three items that the book of hebrews talks about as being symbolic and further says that right now is not the time to speak of them so we know that whoever wrote hebrews because he was a writer of scripture whether it be paul or barnabas or clement or someone else whoever wrote that book was encoding just like the rest of them and was aware of the mystery and was writing according to the unction and to the guidance that was given him by god through the holy spirit and so knowing this, when he says that right now is not the time to, to speak of those things in particular, what he's saying is that there will come a time when these things will be understood in their particulars. So in other words, he's not trying to give it away. He's trying to give you enough evidence and enough to think about so that when that day comes, that day being the, the thousand year period, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years are as a day, and that we currently live in that thousand year period, according to anybody's chronology, because whether we got the timeline right or wrong, we know we're just about there. Um, you know, I... I the, the idea that, that, that we are actually on that Sabbath day, so to speak, that we are in that seventh millennium after 6,000 biblical years, bi uh, chrono uh, biblical chronology, according to biblical chronology, um, there, was, there were 4,000 years between the creation of the world and the coming of Yeshua. Um, that, again, and, and I'm not trying to argue that with the atheists and stuff. That, that's, that, that in and of itself, whether, it, whether it's cosmolo cosmologically correct or whether it's historically correct, what I can affirm is that this is parable and that this is, uh, that it has a meaning. Uh, so it's actually, it's actually teaching that 4,000 years um, uh, preceded the coming of, of Christ, the suffering servant. Um, and that 2,000 years um, from that point up until the time of the millennium, that is the church age, the 2,000 years. And that there is a, a period of 1,000 years, which is the spiritual Sabbath, if you will, because a day is, is a thousand years and a thousand years are as a day. So that's 1,000 year Sabbath day that's tacked on at the end. Again, we're being transformed to have the mind of Christ, to have the, um, the heart, if you will, and the eyes and the ears and whatnot, so that we could be kings and priests and that we could eat of the flesh of these kings. And that, in other words, we, can, we wouldn't be tainted by what they taught. We would be, uh, if you will, beyond it or above it, which is exactly what this does is it lifts you up and puts you beyond 
uh, the ability of, of error, if you will, to hoodwink you again, because again, it is such a fulfillment and it's such a thing. And so again, so going back, this is what's amazing um, because you will reign over the all. You will have the ability to take the all, the everything. Well, first of all, everything that's been taught has been undermined. And God has done this. He's undermined their teaching. Um, so again, the wisdom of men is foolishness to God. You know, and again, I use these common simple terms because I'm speaking to the whole world here, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to get people who might not see to see, you know, so, you know, I, this isn't just for Christians. This is for everyone. This is for people of different faiths. This is for people of no faith. Um, these are for people who, who are searching for some kind of truth somewhere. If you see this, understand the power that's been given to you because this is how you reign. This is how you, this is how you transcend because you've shown the transcendence of, 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 of some power, some great power has written these things down and given time for human beings to fulfill things in them. Because again, the, 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 the encoding is in prospect, speaking uh, about things to come in the clothing, if you will, in the vestiges, of, if you will, uh, the images, if you will, of parabolic things. Um, and so to encode something, to later be decoded, um, again, it gives you, that, it gives you that, that sense of the transcendent nature of whoever wrote those scriptures. It shows that God was behind it. It shows that there's an infinite power. Um, so again, you shouldn't stop seeking until you find. And again, this is, this is what I'm saying. You will find it because it is there. Um, and again, it's everything it says that it is. This is the, this is the self-fulfilling nature of understanding it. When you understand it, then you are transformed, you are changed, and it become the fulfillment, uh, and everything becomes clear to you. Um, it talks about leaders here, for example, the distinction between leaders and um, that oneness that you have with 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 Christ, if you will, with that with that revelation, to know that you're living in in a, in a universe where where God has infinite power and has demonstrated that infinite power. You see that infinite power, and you know that it exists, and you're absolutely 100% convinced because your seeing has been transformed, your hearing has been transformed, your mind has been transformed, you have the mind of Christ, and you know it because you're able to articulate it, and you understand it because none of this stuff is problematic when you do understand it. Um, these are riddles. These are things to be worked out. Um, these are knots to be untied, so to speak, and so they unfold, and they they you, you can un untie these knots, and, and you can demonstrate that through this, basically this one axiom, um, that scriptures are going to be restored to us that have been denied to us and keys are going to be restored to us that have been denied to us. Because again, it talks about the keys of, of knowledge being hidden. Well, again, nothing is hidden that isn't meant to be revealed, right? So the idea of, of, of hiding something, again, these are hidden sayings, right? They're riddles, they're mysteries, things that you wouldn't otherwise understand. And I've listened to a lot of people too, a lot of, of scholarly types, which again, I'm not going to say it in my own words, God says that, that the wisdom of, 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 of men is foolishness and that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And, and, and in a very literal sense, people have put these teachings down. People have put these books down as being foolish and, um, you know, beneath, beneath him. And, uh, you know, and so the idea is that he set them up. He's allowed them in their, in their overweening pride and in their own arrogance uh, to perpetuate something which was not true. And perhaps as importantly, perhaps almost more importantly, perhaps, to hide something that's so patently obvious once you see it. It's like you, you marvel, like you literally marvel, right, that, that, that nobody saw that before. You're just astonished. You're just, uh, you're just dumbfounded that something so clear and so obvious and so absolutely in your face could have been hidden, right? And see, that's, the, that's how you become living. That's how you defeat, if you will, death. Because he's gone before you and done it on your behalf. Death is already conquered. And you can see that because, again, the seeds were there when these things were encoded. So that means that at the time, death had already been conquered. Satan had already been defeated because nothing has changed. Those words are still there. The only thing that's happened is that, that the keys are given and that these books have crawled out of the woodwork, um, have come out from wherever they were hiding for you know nearly 2,000 years and uh, are, are coming back to life because the, the words in them are coming alive and that we come alive by hearing these words um, in the spiritual sense. So he talked about leaders. What about the leaders? He said, well, if your leaders say to you, the kingdom is in heaven, then the birds of heaven will precede you. And if they tell you it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is within you and uh, outside of you. Now, 
it's interesting that this particular one is broken down into three segments. Um, it talks about the birds of heaven. If they say that, it, that the kingdom is in heaven. Now, I believe that this has to do with the way in which these things were um, dispensed. That the idea was that the birds, if you will, fly between the earth and the heaven. And that they, are, they, they, they represent, and again, leaders are, are, are used sort of interchangeably with the, the term birds here. You know, if your leaders tell you, then the birds of, of heaven or whatever will say, you know what I'm saying? There's this connection between leaders and birds here. As the, the, the sense of those being the powers and the authorities, the ones who rule over you. Um, and um, then it says that they tell you it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. And again, the fish here, we talk about in terms of, of the sea, in the Revelation, it talks about the seas are the waters, the many waters are the, the nations and peoples and tongues and kings. So if you just take that metaphorically and plug it back in here, the idea is that the sea is the age. And specifically the Christian age, because of the word fish here, um, that has to do, like, again, ichthyus. You see that picture of the, the, you know, the fish or whatever that represents Christianity. The idea that, um, that, that this has to do with the Christian age. Um, but that the final revelation, if you will, the third dispensation, gives you that other realization. When, when, when you understand that the Bible is something that exists, like in a book, like you can pick it up and say, this is a Bible, this is a thing. And within this thing, there is this mystery, right? Um, then you understand that the, the book is outside of you. The, the book is a thing, right? But it's also written by God. It's also written by the infinite. The, the, the one who has power over all things has given you that book. So you have it in the material sense, but you also realize and you recognize that the world that surrounds you, the world in which you live, you know, in, in a way, like the fish is, in a sense, within a sea. It just surrounds you. That, that the reality has always been God's doing and his power. Uh, you know, he's given space to man. He's given man those six days. And now he's, he's calling him in on the, on the seventh day, the true Sabbath, right? And he's calling us to be um, children of the Sabbath, uh, which, again, that comes up here pretty soon, too. So then that's when you change, when you, when you recognize the kingdom is within you and without, because you realize that all this history took place, and it was wrong, and it was a setup. And he called the end from the beginning and he encoded the end from the beginning uh, and has power over the beginning and middle and the end. Uh, and so naturally it is outside of you, right? But also because you know yourself, this is how it continues, because when you know yourselves, and that's when you will know yourself, um, is when you recognize the truth that the external and the internal, the one who made the outside is the one who made the inside, in other words, that that whole inner outer thing, that, that you don't live in a chaos. You don't live in, um, you don't live in some, and again, I don't want to get too cosmological here, but you, you don't live in something that uh, just sort of happened, okay? There, there is some power, some control that, that gave you that Bible, that gave you this mystery, and therefore gave you this earth, and therefore gave you, the, you know, whatever, the, it, it gave it to you, you're living in it. Um, and it says, and then you will, uh, when you know yourselves, then you will be known. Why? Because there's no difference. There's no difference then, because the same one who created you um, is your eyes, is your ears, you know, is your mouth, is your hands, is that because you become in a sense, the, the property of the one who purchased you bodily, mentally, spiritually, you become, I don't want to use the word slave and servant because that's kind of degrading and it's kind of not true. You're like the honored guest, if you will, like he even talks about that. You know, I invited you to the banquet, you know, come here, let me, let me dress you in fine clothes. Let me give you fine food. All right. The, the, the idea is that we are being drawn into him because he, he, for thousands of years, has longed for this, has wanted this, has, has wanted to bring us to this, which is what? Which is to himself, to see with his eyes, to, to feel with his heart, to understand with his understanding. He's given us this understanding so that we can be like him and wants us to be like him so that he can be in us. And so you realize that you are children of the living father. In other words, you've come to life. You've come to this realization. And again, this is wealth versus poverty. But if you don't know yourselves, you dwell in poverty and you are the poverty. Well, see, well, there is a big difference between knowing this and not knowing this. There's a big difference between seeing this and not seeing this. There's a, there's a big difference between being alive and being dead in the spirit and in the knowledge and in the ability to speak and work and act and, and move uh, in the knowledge. There's a big difference. Um, and again, it moves on. Another, another riddle. Uh, the older person won't hesitate to ask a little seven-day-old child about the place of life and they will live because many of the first will be last and they will become one. Okay, so in a, okay, there, there's two ways you can look at this. One's just a simple, straightforward. The, a, a little child is seven days. I, I'm, not, I'm sure everybody's held a baby in their arms. If you have any kind of soul at all, 
you can feel the baby in your heart when you hold them. You know, if you have any soul at all, when you look into the face of a child who's just born, there's something transcendental about it. There's something otherworldly about it. You're, you're, you're looking at something that has just laid eyes on the world and is just, it's from another place. I mean, literally some other, something else is in that child and, and it, that gets lost because, because of the, the development of the ego and because things happen to that child and the forgetfulness sets in and then they become uh, acculturated and, accustomed, and it's just a gradual loss of the original self. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the, um, the, 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 the spiritual end of it. But the metaphysical or the, the metaphorical, I should say, idea is that again, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years are as a day, as it says in second Peter, which again, that's getting a key from the canon, bring it over here. So it works both ways. So it's like, well, what is a seven day old child? And what is a child? Well, a child metaphorically is the elect. It speaks of in the gospel of truth. It starts out talking about the children and it's, it it's explicitly says that they are the elect who are to come. Uh, it, it says in the secret book of James, it talks about the children who are to come. Uh, these are the people who are to come. These are the elect. So the seven days, a seven day old child is an elect person from the millennium, which is who we are and where we are in time. So a person old in days, to ask a child about a seven day old child about the place of life. Again, we talked about the living, right? The living Jesus, the, the living issue. In other words, uh, the, the idea is that, that life, um, that they've come and they found life again, they found it. They were amazed. They were astonished. They've begun to rule over the all. They have found the place of life. That's them. Um, and then, uh, the older person, you might think the Christians, you might think the Jews, you might think of metaphorically, you know, the whole history of everybody being wrong or whatever sort of collectively in that image as the older person why because the the because because from the mouths of babes if you will from the mouths of his children are going to come this truth and so on a metaphorical sense right that's that's the key to understanding this is that that you when you ask the elect who live in that millennial period who live in that seventh day right they will be able to tell you about the place of life which is what this is attempting to be i'm trying to you know, tell you about the place of life so that you will come alive. And, and the idea is, again, it will happen. Don't seek until you find and, and it will happen. You will reign over the all. And they will, um, they will ask about the place of life and they will live. They will come alive. You see what I'm saying? So in other words, you're going to change the paradigm. You're going to move um, them from where they are to where, where we're meant to be, from the person that was to the person we're destined to become, um, in that we will move on to a more angelic, existence until we finally no longer live on this earth and we transcend uh and we move up there it says and so know what is in front of your face again if you're reading the gospel of thomas on a literary basis what is in front of your face is in fact the gospel of thomas in a very literal sense so if you understand the gospel of thomas for example what is hidden to you will become revealed to you which is what i'm hoping i'm trying to demonstrate here is that the idea is that once you understand that this is meant to pull you out of it and to give you something that was promised to you and to show that this promise can be delivered and it has in fact been delivered. And we're actually already living in that time. We're already living in that age. We're already living with that knowledge. Why is the mountain still there, so to speak? Why can't we just say, you know, be removed and, and cast into the sea, if you will, the Christian age, in other words, to, to remove it and cast it back in time to that age and can contain it there, constrain it there, in other words. You know, um, uh, he goes on, okay, well, again, because again, there's nothing hidden that won't be revealed. And that is because all the answers are going to be given to you. The keys are going to be demonstrated. The mysteries are going to be uh, unfolded. The riddles are going to be unlocked. And uh, the world uh, will, in a sense, be toppled because the foundations upon which it all is built. See, you prove that there's a God. Um, there's all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of this atheism or whatever becomes untenable. And so it's not just Christianity. It's everything. Um, and, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just so, it's just so real. It's just real. It's, it's not just within you. It's also without you because you actually have the power to make that actual change. So we're like, you know, what, four or five logins into this book. And with the eyes of the understanding, you already realize that this is, this is given to us to, to destroy the age and to move on to the next one, that, that it literally is a weapon. That it literally is a sword that comes out of, of the mouth of God. Uh, you know, for us to use in battle against this age and against this enemy. Um, but again, it isn't so it will be destructive. It's so that they will live, right? Because the first will be last. And why? Well, the first one's got it wrong. I, I'm not talking about the ones who encoded it. I'm not talking about the very first Christians. 
the ones who knew the mystery. I'm talking about the ones who, well, there were, there were two sorts, like the scribes and the Pharisees have taken the keys of knowledge and have hidden them. Those are the ones to, if you're an evil person, if you're a really, really wicked person and you hear the truth, um, there's a term, listen, like thieves, you know, the idea is that you want to hear something, but it's because you want to steal and because you want to take advantage of something because you want the power for yourself. And so if you hear these keys, like, and this is why Christians had to be martyred from the beginning. And it becomes clear that this is why the case was because they were speaking the truth and there were the powers that be because there had already been established in Judaism. There had already been established. And this is like the synagogue of Satan aspect of it. The idea is that, that the, they're, they're true Jews and they're false Jews. The idea is that the false Judaism that existed in that culture at that time created the model and created the precedent for the Christians essentially to follow. Yeah, they added books. Yeah, they added a testament. They, they, they shifted a little bit, but fundamentally they, they share a canon, which is false. And um, they share the, the sense of there's a building where you go, that's a church that you go to and that you pay them your tithe and that somebody who tells you that these books that are in this box, whatever they say, coming from that point of view, they of necessity miss the message because the message is fundamentally, there's more than just those books. And now, you know what I'm saying? So in other words, whatever you teach from that point, whatever you teach from that vantage point, is always going to be wrong on some level, no matter how true it is. Like there are things that you can say that are true that fall within canonical. If you have this canonical mindset, you can still say a lot of things that quote unquote are true, but they're not the ultimate truth. And they also deny the ultimate truth in terms of their tradition. So in other words, they, they become invalidated once the truth is known. Uh, they become ineffective once the truth is known. Uh, they become vestigial uh, uh, once the truth is known. Uh, so the idea uh, is that uh, those who were first were the ones who fell prey to these devils who took away these books and took away these keys and took away the understanding and killed the martyrs who knew this stuff. Um, you know, when, when Jesus speaks of Anipas, uh, he says, my, my, my faithful servant. And what he's talking about is somebody who was faithful until the end. Um, now, it's hard to say that this was particularly what he was referring to, but kind of gives you the idea that, that the people who were faithful were martyred. And that the people who knew the truth had to be killed because they formed the pattern on the old image. We, they had a cannon. We'll just have that cannon too, right? They had killed that. They had chopped off that head, if you will, of that dragon or whatever, and it grew back. Because again, the mystery was known and then it was wiped out again, right? And it had the power to speak as it were, as, as the one had before. It had all the powers of one because it, it created itself in that image. In other words, that's what it's talking about there. But the idea is that, that, um, that the first will become last meaning that they failed us, so to speak. But I mean, in, in a sense, because it was meant to be, there's no really failure of anything. It just was the way things were going to go down. And so everything was known ahead of time, knowing that these mysteries would be lost. They made it so that it could be found again and would be found again. These books came back to us again from out of the woodwork from various places or whatever, and have, have crept back into our popular imagination. Um, I've done what I could, I think, to popularize them. I read them for people. I made them available to people, uh, you know, and, and, and I tried my best all these years to try and, and articulate as best I could at whatever level I was at any given time, what, what these books were about. And it hasn't met with so much um, in terms of uh, opposition, although there is a little bit of that, but it's not super significant. There are a lot of people who believe these books, but they believe them on a highly subjective level. Like it just sound right to me, or they just seem right to me, or they just feel right to me, or they just, they have a spirit in them that speaks to me or something. But what I'm saying is there are very specific things that these books say that can be demonstrated and should be demonstrated and they should be shouted from the rooftops. You know, again, this is not to complain, but you can go back to some of the earlier videos on my channel. Like going back to, there's me sitting at the end of the table. I think I was, uh, I was 30 years old at the time. It was the year 2000. And I was just sitting at the end of the table with a, a old fashioned VHS tape recorder. And I did a presentation. This was way before there was ever a YouTube. I, I sort of was like, well, the technology may come someday or, you know, I, you know, I, but at the time I was just getting my ideas out there because I, you know, but I've been saying the same things, I guess, for a very long time. And so I know from my own experience. You know, got a loud noise here. So go ahead, Robert. Sorry. But I know from my own experience that 20 years can go by and the world isn't changed. You know, I know from my own experience that, that 20 years can go by speaking the truth and people will look at the messenger and not the message. You know, the people will look at, well, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it, it's, it, it's not a matter of who any one of us are. are. Mm -hmm. It is a matter of what the word says. And it's a matter of the logic and the, um, the, the power and the insight that this, this really is the one thing. Because again, uh, whatever, whatever sort of fascination 
um, other Christians may have with other aspects of the Bible. And I'm not speaking out against any of those things, but people will fixate on certain things. And I'm saying if there's anything worth fixating on, it's this, because at the end of this particular um, rainbow, so to speak, right, there is the delivery of an entirely new testament and an entirely new understanding and an entirely new way of seeing and, and hearing that um, that is very real and is very tangible. Um, and it, like I said before, it can be demonstrated. Um, there are a lot of things that are, I think, uh, on some level, at least a little bit speculative and that uh, lead to, you know, conflicts within and between people which whether they're true or not is a little bit beside the point. This is something that can be demonstrated and can be shown. And I think it's important to focus on what is the way forward. I mean, in terms of what actually functions uh, to, to disabuse us of our illusions and to lead us into the kingdom, what, what actually is going to make this happen because of the universal truth of it. So, so that, just a paraphrase, just a paraphrase, sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> is that the understanding of this, which, you know, I, I think I found your channel like before 2010 on YouTube. So I, I do remember going all of, over all of your videos, your patience that you've shown is phenomenal. And the fact, the fact that you said, you know, that you did this before there was a YouTube, you knew there was an internet and you just somehow thought maybe, maybe you thought you'd have a website, right? And then I, I made you the website and I resource and listen and read from your website. I've put the link in the, in the chat. If anyone's listening now live, you can go to the scriptural dash truth.com. Robert has just about everything you could need to, to really, really dive into this. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah. And let me, let me just, since you're on the subject, let me give a shout out to, um, uh, the gentleman's name is Rick. Um, his, his YouTube channel is Jesus love seven twenty three. And what I can tell you is that first of all, he contacted me about this and he wanted to do this, not for me, particularly, but for the message, because he felt strongly and he had IT skills and he had the ability uh, to, to do this and the willingness to do it and the passion to do it. And so anything that you donate to that channel, that's, that's him, that's his doing, that's his work of, of, of uh, dedication. That's his labor of love, you know, name? and I encourage people, his name is Rick, again, no, his YouTube, yeah. his YouTube channel is Jesus Love 723. And so I really got to give him a shout out. Uh, and I got to give a, sh a shout out to a lot of people who have helped me over the years. Again, this isn't some congratulatory thing. This is, you know, sincere appreciation for people who, who have helped me. Um, there, um, you know, there have been people who have helped me financially. Um, the Carpenter Son, there's lots of people on Patreon who have helped me out. There's a lot of people who, you know, will let, you know, the ads play or whatever. But again, I want to do, I want to transcend all that. I want to say that the, that what that, ultimately is is people being faithful and people being helpful and people doing something and that's the thing somebody doesn't have to join me or be a part of me in any way whatsoever uh for this to be for this to be meaningful and for this to be uh valid because this is for everybody the elect it, the, the the truth itself transcends everything just like i said before about one plus one equals two it's just true in and of itself and there, there's there's no gateway uh other than the gateway that we might subjectively put there ourselves or you know subjectively buy into but whether when somebody wants to say two one and one is three or whatever it doesn't matter they might be able to enforce a lie on the carnal level they might be able to enforce a lie on uh you know because of power that they have or else uh because their their skills at lying or deception they might be able to put forward a fraud uh what this is is the absence of knowledge that um rectifies itself with the um the fulfillment of knowledge or the coming across of knowledge or the truth of, of the teaching. Um, and um, it's like it says in the gospel of truth, you know, it's something that, that, that sort of, it sort of falls down and is easily set back up again. Um, the idea is that the, that, that the scriptures themselves are because they are words and because they are imagery and because they are, they're fixed, you know, the scriptures are not altered or alterable. Now I realize that, some of the ones we have down have variants in them and little mistakes or whatever based on scribal errors or based on, you know, whatever, different different textual variants. But by and large, the scriptures themselves are static. They don't change. They just are. Uh, we might get books that come back to us, like we were lucky to get this book back to us. We didn't have this book in 1920 or 1900. You know, we have it now. You know, uh, the, the idea is that, um, that these things are fixed and that they're static. And so because of that, and again, because it, within God, there is no, there is no shadow of turning. Like I was saying before, there were three items in the Ark of the Covenant all the way back at the beginning when this, when this design was given and when this revelation was given and when these, these artifacts were put in there for symbolic purposes, right? 
the idea was that there there were the tables that were handed to Moses that um, that were given on Mount Sinai, and that these represent the um, the Old Testament, the tables of the law. And in Hebrews, it talks about how Yeshua is our high priest, and that we the, he sits at the, the 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 side of the Father, right in heaven, but that his earthly counterpart, the image on earth, is the earthly high priest. And so when you look at the the rods of Aaron, who was the earthly high priest, and was actually the, the, the actual spokesperson, the, the actual spokesman for Moses. He did most of the actual talking to the people uh, on Moses' behalf. In, in a lot of ways, just a, a, in, in a similar way to the way that Yeshua is the ambassador, if you will, to most of the people probably on so, earth. So what about, um, what just to quickly interrupt, what about Melchizedek being the high priest to Abraham, who was given the covenant for, you know, for all time as well, right? Could that fit in? Well, because again, it's, it's like you could... You, the, the idea here is that, yes, Melchizedek represented a higher priesthood, a higher order to whom Abraham would pay tithes um, or Abraham would pay tithes. The, the idea that, um, that, that he would owe him, that, that the lesser, um, that, the, that, that, that he being lesser would be the one who was indebted to give the tithe to Melchizedek and that you would only give the tithe if it were, um, if he were of a different priesthood or of a different order, you know, and again, this is, in a sense, a kind of a priesthood. This is kind of a different priesthood because, because it, it, well, it is bringing a kind of like a like a like a higher level meaning. I guess it's something to whom Christians and Jews, for example, would be indebted to because, again, um, because they will seek the place of life and that they will come alive because of the the teaching uh, of the of the new holy priesthood, if you will, of the elect who are chosen according to God's will. Uh, in his time because again they are the last who will be first they come last and become first and then they become one by the way because everybody comes into agreement at long last now this this may play out and in, in, this may be prolonged i'm not sure how it's going to play out um if i if i knew I'd, I'd say it but um the idea is that at some point there's not going to be the jew and the christian and the elect that they will all three become one um but my, the my, transfiguration my, on the mount happened right the three became the one right well yeah he looked up and there 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 was only there was only a shoe there with him um the idea oh, well okay so getting back to the 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 imagery of the ark of the covenant because it correlates with the um with the transfiguration uh so this is something i think is helpful and people should see so i kind of bring it up almost every time but the idea is that there were three items in the ark of the covenant which is a box of covenants so if you had a box of covenants and there were three symbolic items in them that they would represent the three stages of revelation one again the tables of law given to moses represents the covenant the law the torah the whatever and it collectively represents the old testament and that aaron being the earthly counterpart to the high priest in heaven is the earthly counterpart to yeshua who is symbolized in, in a sense by melchizedek he's a priest forever after the order of melchizedek in other words he's an eternal priest the one that sits at the right hand of the father and not the one not the earthly counterpart so the idea is melchizedek is like the one who sits by god's throne so as it states in hebrews that that the, the earthly high priest has to bring sacrifices yearly because it cannot atone for his sins because they're fleshly flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom and flesh and blood cannot uh provide forgiveness of sins only the true high priest which again who is after the order of melchizedek right and then there's that third item which is the the jar of manna the golden jar of manna and again because he was calling the beginning from the end because he was encoding he knew that those of us who were in the middle the, the, the gospel of truth talks about those of us who are in the middle, right? The, the interim, the time of the interim, the, the, the fish in the sea, so to speak, from one end of the church age to the other, the 2,000 years, right? That, um, that when he was speaking in terms of, of, of them, he couldn't come out and say it. He's like, of, of which right now is not the time to speak, right? And so why is he being cagey? Well, he kind of is and he's kind of not. He's kind of telling you without saying it in so many words. If you, if you come to understand the truth in time, then you get what he was getting at. He couldn't tell you explicitly, but he was going to, but, but the pieces would fall into place once you understood, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It would make sense once everything else made sense why he was being cagey because he couldn't come right out and give away a mystery like the, the, the contents of the, the, the Ark of the Covenant in so many words because then the powers of that be or whatever would probably get rid of that book too. And besides, it would blow the mystery. It's designed to be lost and it's designed to be found. So if you articulate it in so many words, then it never gets a chance to be lost so, uh, so that it could be found. So it has to be disguised. It has to be on the down low, so to speak, so that people in time will appreciate it. And that's the truth with the whole mystery. Um, 
so like even it just goes on you know it says that do you want us to fast how should we pray should we give alms um what kind of food should we avoid um <clears throat> the interesting thing about this particular statement is that it's actually answered later on here in 14 like the direct answer is if you fast you'll bring guilt upon yourselves and if you pray you'll be condemned and if you give alms you will harm your spirits right so why and, and i'll go into that in a minute he answers this because it's kind of sandwiched between the question and the answer and so this kind of leads up to why the answer is the answer but the short to just cut to the chase the reason why is because their fast is a physical fast like they're eating they're, they're choosing not to eat food and what he's saying is he wants them to have a spiritual fast um, and if they pray or that they give alms, they do it after the flesh. And he wants them to pray in the spirit, of which they have no idea how to pray in the spirit because they wouldn't, they wouldn't know how to ask for the thing that they're going to end up getting, right? So they don't have it within them to pray properly in the sense that, you know, oh, please, you know, let the mysteries be restored to us or whatever that we already, you know what I'm saying? They, they, in a sense, they would fall short because their prayers, they don't, they're not privy to the answers that we're going to be privy to. Uh, and, and especially them at the time because of them and their carnal nature and their carnal state. Um, and you'll notice that anytime you have questions from the apostles and the disciples, you know, and again, no offense, but a lot of times uh, Jesus kind of counters them all with, you know, uh, you don't get it. You don't understand. He kind of gives them the business sometimes when they ask a question um, because he's coming from an entirely different place from where they're coming. He's coming from the spirit and they're coming from the flesh. Uh, so they're asking about real foods to be avoided. They're talking about actual physical alms, like, oh, let me give you a, a, a coin or something. Let me give you a bag of grain or something. Those are their, uh, their alms, right? But what is the spiritual fast? And what is the spiritual prayer? And what is the spiritual alms? And what is the spiritual food, right? That's the real answer, right? The, the spiritual fast is for them to give up these mysteries for 2,000 years. That's the, that's, the, that's the lack of spiritual food that we're going to go through. They can't provide that consciously or they can't give it in terms of flesh because if they go without a few meals, that's not the same thing. You see I'm saying? That's not gonna, that, that by itself is perhaps commendable. There may be some spiritual value, but it's not the real fast. Uh, he's saying if you, if you fast, right, according to the fast of your rules, you're gonna bring guilt upon yourselves. Um, because again, you're not, you're, you're not- Just to giving, interject. Could that also be explained on a fleshly level, like um, having titsies and, and growing your beard and purposely doing all these pious fleshly things when it, he's saying that that's what you're going to do if you fast, right? Sorry. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't want to particularize. I would just say that anything that was ritualistic, that was ritualistic for the sake of being a ritual or was or any kind of strict obedience that's purely just a blind obedience, it doesn't, it doesn't affect things long term. They, they affect things short term. They affect things in someone's lifetime. If I were to give you an alm, if I was to throw some money your way or something, you know, that's great and all. But what's greater? The spiritual alm. You know, and if I was to fast in the flesh, you know, I could probably stand to lose a few pounds, right? You know, that might be great and all, right? But it's going to what? Um, it's going to bring guilt upon myself because why? Because it's not the spiritual fast. In other words, it's not... Um, it's, it's not effective in the sense that the spiritual fast is effective, I guess is what I'm trying to say. The spiritual fast is like, we did, we, we did not have all of our food, so to speak, for these few days, these spiritual days, right? We, we only had the food that was placed before us and not the full banquet, if you will. Um, and again, without knowing what to pray for, they'll be condemned because again, no, the answer is the end. The end game is to have the answer. So if you pray without having the answer then your prayers are going to be ineffectual because latent within latent within that prayer is a prayer for something and you don't know that for which you should ask right because they don't have the ability to pray for the right thing i guess is what i'm trying to say it's kind of abstruse but the idea is that if you make a physical alm for example he's saying if you make your kind of alms in other words if you make donations right or you know if you donate in the physical sense then you're going to harm your spirit. Why? Because the spirit is contrary to the flesh. A spiritual donation would be to write something that was going to be rejected for it to be recovered in time or to, to put knowledge in a book that isn't, isn't rejected, but is misunderstood. In other words, for a length of time. So in other words, like if, if you write something and it's canonical, there's an almond that, that you're giving to a future generation, someone to find. 
right? In other words, you're giving them something. They're giving us something. They're giving us our eyes to see. They're giving us our ears to hear. In other words, they're giving us the power to overcome the world, like very literally overthrow the institutions of the world with this new knowledge that has been provided to us by the Almighty. So that being said, um, and, and, and again, this is why it kind of continues. He says, if they welcome you into any, and when you enter into any land, and you got to think in terms of land, in terms of the, the 2000 years, I mean, whatever their course in history was, wherever they spread across the earth, whatever, you know what I'm saying? You're thinking of it in terms of metaphorical uh, terms. It, it does refer to them in specific. Uh, but again, and you go in around into the countryside, that sort of encompasses the age. When you're, when you're between here and there, between the beginning and the end, in other words, where your teachings go, wherever, you know, just eat whatever they put before you, right? Uh, in other words, just let the cannons be the cannons. Let, let what you eat be what is eaten. And it heal those who are sick among them um, uh, and eat whatever they give you. In other words, to, to, to kind of put it into, in a, in a, into terms that would, that would correspond with what I'm trying to say, um, let's say I walked into a group, a room full of Protestants, um, and they only accepted the 66 books. So in other words, that's the food that's placed before me, right? That within those 66 books, right, whatever they give me, I should be able to open their eyes and heal them based on just that. Um, you know, it will lead them to this other food, this other spiritual food, of course, because that's what it's designed to do. But I'm showing them within the food that they accept that it's, that, that it's kosher, so to speak, that it's good. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that, that bears itself out because again, like I'm talking about the Ark of the Covenant, when, when he talks about the third item, which is the jar of manna, um, the idea was that, um, when you read the book of revelation, um, he talks about to him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. So that again is a future revelation. I will give to eat as a function of what, as a function of overcoming, right? What are you overcoming? You're overcoming these canonical boundaries, first of all. Well, I mean, like, it's just common sense. I mean, like I was saying, if Jude is quoting Enoch, and he literally says these things, he makes a, a little list of statements. He's saying, um, and Enoch also, he cites the, the name of the book. So you can just write on there, he cites the name of the book, Enoch also. He goes the seventh from Adam. You can just write as a footnote. Oh, he's, he's, he's giving him his antiquity. He's dating him to the antediluvian times. It was that Enoch, right? Prophesied to these men or of these men, right? Meaning, okay, right, parenthetically, Enoch is a prophet, right? And then he gives the quote, you know, that the Lord cometh with 10,000s of his saints and all that, right? So he's quoting the book. So in other words, Jude might, might just as well have written, you don't have to read too deeply between the lines. This literally is what that statement is saying. He's saying that, that Enoch is the source, that Enoch is ancient, that Enoch is authoritative because he's, he is a prophet. He prophesied of these men. And this is the book that you have because he gives a lengthy quote. So you know, you got the book, you know, which book it is, right? You know that it's ancient and you know that it's authentic. Now, Judas basically said, this book is ancient, it's authentic, it comes from Enoch, and here it is. And it's valid, right? So that by itself, right, you you already transcend canonical boundaries just from knowing that. See, that was the thing. That was that was the thing that I had, like, just as a, you know, I, I understood, I guess, before I could articulate. Um, well, I think I kind of came out at the time and articulated. That was the thing that got me interested. Because nobody, nobody except for the Ethiopic church, of course, uh, had the book of Enoch as canonical. So here you have you here you have dude who is supposedly the brother of Yeshua or his stepbrother or however you look at it. The idea though is that he knew Yeshua, that he lived in the same house with Yeshua, that if Jude is saying this, it might just have been something Yeshua was saying. It might have been something he he, he heard him talk about because he was, you know, he was right there eating from the same table, presumably, living under the same roof, presumably, perhaps going around with him as he taught. You know, it's not that far that that much of a stretch. Although, you know, it is stated that they were outside and, you know, his followers were in the room with him listening to him, you know, that those were his true brothers and mothers and whatever. But that being said, um, whether he believed him at the time, he certainly believed him at the time he wrote that book. And having written that book, he, he and, and this is where it's such a bone of contention, because there, there's so many people who would argue that, uh, number one, that it might be some other book. Well, that would imply that the Ethiopic canon was was somehow wrong or that it was corrupted or whatever, but it accords with the Greek fragments that we have, and it accords with, to some extent, with the Hebrew fragments that we have. So there's very little evidence that it deviates in any significant way. So this is that book. This is a quote from that book, because if Judah had quoted that book at the time, um, it would have been understood because the book was popular at the time and was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? So it was contemporary, for sure. 
So that would have created a uh, confusion, I suppose, uh, if he'd have been speaking of some other book, had it been the same book. You know what I'm saying? Why would he have caused this confusion by giving that quote that still exists? You know what I'm saying? So in other words, uh, you, you know, know very little, <clears throat> I just have to interrupt you. The parable that you just gave about how the mother and brothers and sisters were those that were with him, they, mm -hmm. were, they were listening. That basically is, again, a parable to the third dispensation because Jude was with him in that time doing these things, but yet he still gave a shout out to another group that were with him at that time. And I guess it will be the same in this time, right? It's just really interesting that you brought that out. Well, I mean, again, the, the point is the point is that that it was it's just it's not some it's not some little curiosity. It's not some little aside. You have to look at everything as being there on some level of exactitude. Like there, there is a reason why Jude might just as well have said, look, here's a source that's ancient and that's authentic and prophetic. Uh, and it pertains to these people who are in my time right here, right now. Uh, because again, a lot of the naysayers have the opinion that the book of Enoch is not ancient, but that runs counter to what Jude is saying. And that they, they are a lot of people who would contend that he's not authentic, but that runs counter to what Jude is saying. He says he's a prophet. There are people who would say that this is not authentic or whatever, uh, or that it uh, doesn't pertain to this age. A lot of people will constrain the book of Enoch to the time of the flood, right? That the wicked, the removal of the wicked and the ungodly, so to speak, pertain to the flood, right? And so they'll constrain it to, well, maybe that book was valid, but it was only, it, it wasn't talking about the end of the world, so to speak, but only the time of the flood, you know, so that it didn't have any bearing after the flood. You know, we have that book because it was carried over on the ark somehow, some way. Uh, at least according to the biblical explanation, it would have come over, either it would have been recited or it would have been carried over as it, well, as it was written. You know? Of course, Noah would have brought it. It's the teachings that were handed down through his family. Enoch was told, write this and hand it down, right? And and again, this is, this is I'm sure, where Moses got a lot of his, uh, you know, teachings from Genesis was from these works and others that were brought over. And I think what, I, this is kind of my opinion. Okay, so I like to clarify when I can defend something when I just kind of have an opinion. My opinion is that there were libraries of this stuff that were brought over, uh, the world of this, the, the world of knowledge that was brought over, and and to whatever extent it wasn't brought, it was brought over, it wasn't brought over in written form. It certainly could have been uh, recited and in the memories of you know Noah and his children, you know, and his family. So uh, you know, the, 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 there had to have been some reason why there is a bridge between this world and the, the previous one. Like, why do we even need Noah unless he's bringing something? I mean, yeah, just himself, sure. You know, all the various uh, peoples of the world, so to speak, sure. But why was that necessary? I mean, you're going to kill off everybody. What's what's eight more? You know what I'm saying? When it comes down to it, why, why, what, do you, what do you need to bring from that age? The teachings, the knowledge, the books, perhaps. You know, it makes sense to me anyway that a lot of that would have been preserved and handed down and would have acted as a source material for a lot of what, what Moses knew. Uh, and Moses, I'm sure, probably got it from Jewish sources. But, you know, being that Egypt, you know, that they probably had access to ancient documents and him being privileged and all, knowing who he was, taking an interest in those things, uh, probably steeped himself in some of that. Uh, you know, I wouldn't quite, I wouldn't doubt it. Uh, again, that's a little bit speculative, but it's certainly not inconsistent. The idea is that there is this unbroken, um, if you will, uh, tradition from antediluvian times down to our day in understanding the power of the Bible understanding the power of the scripture by seeing how it is fulfilled just the way in which it said it would be fulfilled seeing that knowing that what is outside the external uh fits what you know fits your knowledge and then you realize that there is no objective and subjective it's all one big thing and what you got to do is get in line with that and then once that happens then because that's the will of the almighty so to speak it's interesting you that you say that because last night there was an alignment in the stars and the the wandering star Jupiter actually had its moves, moons also aligned as the moon and all the other planets were aligned. And you saying tonight that we need to align ourselves. So to recap, you're saying that the fact that the, the heavenly scriptures were laid down from the beginning to the end and throughout that the scriptures actually became living because now we understand there was the threefold dispensation and the parables. And what you're saying now is that we can then therefore take out all of churchianity, all of, you know, all of the miscon the, the wrong teachings and, and reign over the all and that we're going to be changed into something new and then we're going to reign for a thousand years continuing to teach this right and, and share more about this is that the way that it sounds yeah that's that's how it all gets started i think there's a um there's a big question mark as to just exactly what happens from this point forward but this is going to get us over the hump and that's what it's there for that's the design of it you know and up to that point 
Um, because why do you have the power to overcome the world? I mean, it literally says that you will reign over the all. And that sounds like such a ridiculous statement until you realize, hey, the, the whole foundation has gone. The, everything you based it, it on is gone. So what, is that, what does that tell you? That, that tells you you have tremendous power uh, and tremendous uh, ability to, to make this change. You know, and it might take 20 years. It might take 30 years. It, it might happen next week. Nobody really knows. It, it, it has to do with the timing. Uh, you know, all I can tell you is, like I said, you know, perhaps on again, perhaps off again. But, you know, I've always kept my videos, you know, up at least on some level. Uh, I have taken down some of the more redundant ones and some of the ones I wasn't allowed to have up, let's say. But for the most part, it's, it's pretty much unbroken this whole time. You know, I've been saying this this whole time. Like I said, if you go back and you look at those, those first videos I put out, like you may be wrong about the Apocrypha or putting together a gospel you know, or any of that stuff. If you go back and you read the, the guidebook for the elect, the guidebook for the elect was the very first thing that I ever, that I ever put together. It was, uh, it was, it was at the time that I felt like these truths were, were coming to me somehow, some way. I was just listen and listen and listen and listen. And I'm thinking if A, then B, then C, then D, and it's all coming together because I got something in hand and now I'm getting more and I'm getting more and I'm getting more. So it's like, you're making progress, right? And then I'm like, let me put it down into words. So I'm putting it down into words. Let me, let me put it out there on video. So I'm putting it out there on video. Right. And then a few years later, you know, YouTube comes on board. I come on board YouTube and, and I'm, I've got all this backlog of, of scriptures that I've been reading and listening to that I can share. I've got this, this kind of starter videos or whatever that I can just upload. I've got these documents that I put together from my own research and from just the, the unction I felt at the time to write things because it's kind of hard to explain why I do what I do. I am kind of off again, on again about a lot of things, but that's also because I have a lot of interest. And I have, you know, I mean, scriptures are, are one thing, but I have to, I have to kind of go and touch all of my bases and, and be a complete human being. And then I come back to these things and I always come back to them with fresh eyes, fresh experiences, fresh insights. And they, they speak to me on an even deeper level, you know, when this sort of thing happens. And so I feel like it's, it's, there's a time and a season for everything. Uh, you know, there, there, there's a development in life, you know, and that's probably why I learned these things when I was young, because these things are going to take a long time. Uh, I was really about 24, 25 when these things started to dawn on me, when these, these, these inklings just sort of like came and it wasn't one or two years later, I was writing the guidebook for the elect and I was doing, you know, you may be wrong about the, the Apocrypha and stuff. And it just grew and it grew and it snowballed from there because the thing was, all it was, was me trying to put everything together, connect the dots, connect the thoughts, if you will, connect the, you know, how does this apply to this and this and this? And how does this give insight into this and this and this? And how does, how does this work? And it just kept unfolding and it just kept giving and it just kept, you know what I'm saying? And it was because that was the design because it was meant to be, you were meant to, to seek it and not stop until you find. And then when you find, you know, it's amazing, which of course it is. Uh, and then you reign over the all. Um, but what I'm saying is, is you can learn this in a very short period of time. It, it doesn't have to take you a lifetime because some of the groundwork's been laid. You know, some of it's already been articulated, but the thing, the, the thing about it is, it's like it says, you're not going to have to ask your brother or whoever for who, who the Lord is, because everybody's going to know them themselves. The idea is to become transcendent. You know that, that Jude is speaking outside of canonical boundaries. That's just an objective fact, right? Whether you're an atheist or, or some other religion or whatever, look, he, he's quoting this book and he's reading from this book that Christians are. The Christians accept his word in their Bible, but they reject what he's saying. Is there, is there any dissonance here? What about, what if, what if, I know this sounds crazy, but what if you just believe it? What if you just take him at his word? Then what happens, right? That's the road less traveled. You know what I'm saying? That was, that was the thing that made all the difference. You know, that's the thing that, that, that gets you there is to follow the word wherever it leads. Like God be true and every man a liar. I mean, all these things that you hear over and over again, you read over and over again, right? If you just believe what he says, then you go and you find it somewhere else. And then you go and you find it somewhere else. And you, you again, you have it in hand. And then more is put into your hand, right? And then you have, I mean, I don't need to go through every example. I could tell you two or three or four examples. I could eat whatever's placed before me and hopefully heal some of the sick that are out there based on just what they accept. I don't have to, I don't have to take them on every little, extreme. it just, it, the whole thing is kind of like DNA. It just goes around and around and around and around and around on itself. And it, it all kind of just says the same thing. And it doesn't matter which ones of these books you get or you don't get. There are missing pieces here and there, but by and large, you know, so day to day all are talking about the same thing well i would use instead of using that analogy i would use the holographic analogy because when you actually cast a hologram in 3d space you can take a snippet of that uh filter that you're shining the light through and you can still get the same hologram and if you split that piece again you can still get the same hologram again it's like a fractaling effect right 
it is like that. I mean, and that's what I'm saying. This is kind of a demonstration of that. Um, like, like what he says here, like when we were just, just leaving off, and I know I'm kind of meandering here, but I'm just saying this, you, this is just me sticking my toes in the water here. I mean, it, it gets deep. Um, you know, he, the, the question, the answer to this question, first of all, why is it here? What does this statement have to do with this statement when this answer seems so much more direct, right? So why is that there? Well, again, because, because, because you have to be able to, you have to be capable of lateral thinking or thinking outside the box. You know, it's very discursive to go from this question to that answer. And it's absolutely 100% valid. I, I, will, I will do that all day, every day. I will jump around. Um, but why is this answer here? Because the idea here is you don't lie and you don't do what you hate because, and again, what is lying? You know, that's, that's the falsehood that comes out of your mouth. And what is the hate, the thing that comes out of your heart, right? Get your heart right, right? Get your, get your, get your truth right, so to speak, because everything is revealed in the sight of heaven. In other words, from the heavenly level, everything is discernible. I, I can tell you that I know that these were encoded because I have the heavenly vision uh, to see anyway enough to know that if I can decode, it was encoded. So it's plain, it's revealed. Um, and there's nothing hidden that won't be revealed. So now that it's revealed, in other words, in the eyes of heaven, with the eyes of the heavenly, with the, in the sight of heaven, on the heavenly level, in other words, if you have the heavenly level understanding, uh, for there's nothing hidden that won't be revealed and nothing covered up, which will stay secret. Okay, so in other words, he, because he's de they're dealing with things that are hidden, they couldn't possibly know what any of these questions are really about. You know what I'm saying? So in other words, I've got to give you the foundation of some of this, what I'm telling you before I give you the straight up plain answer. So I got to build up to it a little bit, right? I'm telling you that your hearts aren't right. I'm telling you that the words that you affirm to be true aren't really quite true. You know, so when you speak, you're going to lie. And when you do, you're going to do things that you yourself wouldn't want those to be consequences. Your fast isn't going to cut it. Your prayers don't know what to ask for. Your alms are temporary. And, uh, you know, your, your, your dietary, whatever, you know, what goes into your mouth goes into the draft, so to speak, into the toilet, into the, in, into the commode. You know what I'm saying? It, that, it literally is what he's saying. You don't really know what you're talking about. And, and again, those are pretty harsh words. But like I said, almost all the time when, when he's having these conversations with the apostles, you get the idea that they really aren't on the same page as he is. You know, well, so, they, how could they be really? Because it had to take the entire time to unfold. He, he was just doing the best that he could to show them at their point. Right. And so, again, so he speaks to them in riddles because, again, this book is riddles. OK, so what are, what's going to happen? This is like a prophecy here. So he's telling him, OK, you don't understand. You don't get it. And let me tell you a little bit about what's going to happen in the future. OK, we read in, in um, Peter, he talks about the, the devil goeth about as a, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Right. So if you are able to eat the lion, in other words, if you are able to take what is wicked or what is evil and you're able to make. Uh, you're able to uh, see through it, so to speak. You're able to conquer it. In other words, you're, you're, you, you eat the lion. In other words, you destroy Satan. You, you, like you can drink a poison, like a spiritual poison uh, without dying. Or you, know, you, could, you could pick up a, a spiritual snake, so to speak. I mean, I'm not saying go out and handle venomous snakes. It's just that these are like the religious authorities. Like what did John the Baptist call them? You know, he said, you vipers, right? So what is, the, what is the devil? He's like a roaring lion. So if you're able to conquer the devil, right? And that's when you know what your fast is, when you know what your prayer is, when you know what the true spiritual alms are, when you know what the true food is. Like there's no spiritual food to be avoided. If you understand how to read it, there's nothing to be avoided because it's what comes out of your mouth, right? That comes from the heart, which is full of hatred and falsehood and whatever. Um, so if you're able to conquer the devil, right? You're able to eat the lion, in other words. You become human, you transcend, you transform. Um, again, and how awful for the human who's eaten by the lion. Why? Because you start out knowing the truth and you lose it, right? And the lion becomes human, human in the sense that he takes over the church and, and controls the age, right? So again, there's prophecy here. So he's giving them insight into their hearts because he's clarifying what this question is, right? And then he's saying, look, these are the days that are coming, right? That uh, he said that the human being is like, and he elucidates, he says the human being is like a wise fisher who casts his net into the sea. Again, the sea is the age, the Christian age where the fish are which are the imagery of, you know, ichthyus, again, like we're talking about, uh, and drew it up from the sea full of little fish. These are little Christianities. These are all the different denominations, all the different, you know, teachings throughout the age, the teachings of men, the ones that are based on these false assumptions, right? That you should pray or that you should fast or that you should do this, that or the other. Those are the little fish. 
And among them, the wise fishermen found, again, this is wisdom. This has to do with insight, right? You come to know the truth. The truth will make you free. Uh, you come to discover the meaning of these words. You won't taste of death, right? So the wise fisher found a fine large fish, right? Why? Why is that fish large? Because that's the right one. That's the true Christianity, right? And why is it not small? Because it isn't one that's been taught. It's the one that comes at the end. Because again, I know it's kind of a you know obvious thing to say, but you find the big fish, right? And what do you used to do with all the little fish? You cast them back into the age, into the sea. You say, we're done with this, right? We're done with this, right? And you easily choose the large fish because again, why is this a large fish? Because it works for Thomas, it works for Mark, it works for the gospel of truth, it works for all of them, right? So you could choose the large fish because again, the large fish transcends the canonical boundaries, let's say. It has to do with the larger picture, so to speak. And again, anyone who has ears, uh, that's that's plural. You have a physical ear and you have a spiritual ear. You see, you have it with your spiritual eye, you have, you know, so if you have ears to hear, in other words, if you understand things on two level, you should hear. And it's going to be obvious to you. And he says, okay, the sower went out, took a handful of seeds and scattered them. Some fell on the roadside. The birds came and gathered them. Remember the birds that were the Jews, right? They came and gathered them. Others fell on the rock, right? And again, the rock, upon this rock, I will build my church right? So this is the church age. They didn't take root in the soil and the ears of grain didn't rise towards heaven. And again, this is linear. Like what is the roadside? Well, again, it's where people walk. It's tradition. In other words, you know, you're just walking in the ways of your father. You, you made a little road or whatever for people. It's tradition. It's the way everybody walks, the way everybody goes, right? And so what was traditional? Well, it was the canon. The canon was the tradition. 24 prophets spoke in Israel and they all spoke in you. That's 24 is referred to the canon, right? The birds came and gathered them, right? Um, so all the seeds that fell upon the roadside or whatever were devoured by the Jews and others fell upon the rock and they didn't take root in the soil and ears and grains and rise towards heaven. Again, well, I mean, metaphorically, what is he saying? They didn't reach the heavenly level, right? And others fell upon thorns. That's riches. So like even now in our age where we have tremendous wealth, I mean, there's still tremendous poverty, but just unfathomable wealth. And also just in terms of knowledge, I mean, how many books do we have? I mean, you can go on the internet and download hundreds. You might even be able to find a thousand of these books if you really look. That doesn't mean they're all valid. You have to look at what they actually say. In other words, if they decode, they were encoded. And if they decode and they were encoded, that means that the mystery was known at the beginning. So then you know that that one's good, right? So that's how you know. So it's not a, it's not a list, so to speak, although it kind of is. I mean, I can say, well, I'll, I'll add Thomas because I know I can read that. You know what I'm saying? Something like that I could, I could, I could see. But the idea is that, is that you're understanding from, like he even says in this book, he says, you don't, you don't know who I am from how I speak to you or what I say to you, Right. Um, but you have become like the Jews, where they either love the tree or the tree, or they hate the fruit, or they love the fruit, or they hate the tree, right? You're either a Christian, and you don't like Judaism, or you're a Jew, and you don't like Christianity. You know what I'm saying? The idea is that you don't see the wholesomeness of the whole thing, the whole tree, in other words. You know, that the, the, the fruit wouldn't be without the tree, and there's no point in the tree without the fruit. You know what I'm saying? So, um, and others fell on thorns, and they choked the seeds, and the worms ate them. Um, and this is an interesting part here. The worms ate them. Um, now, this is at the point in the church age, I think, where um, the, because the, the seed was eaten, right, um, that, uh, that the first seeds were scattered by the birds. That, that was the powers that, that then were the first, the first ones. Those were the, the, the Jews and their traditions. Um, and they gathered them, right? Again, the gathering of the, the words, the gathering of the scriptures is kind of like canonizing. Um, others fell upon the rock and they didn't take root. And the ears didn't rise toward heaven. So in other words, confusion set in. The people didn't understand the heavenly meaning of the seed. They didn't understand the heavenly meaning of the word. In other words, and others fell on the thorns and they soaked, they choked the seeds and worms ate them. So again, certain seeds were lost. Certain books were lost. So this had to have been when the canon was further pared down because these books were consumed by worms. So these worms metaphorically represent the Protestants in the Protestant age. So this is prophecy. Right. So you can see that if this book was written, even if you took the most cynical point of view, this book was written in the second or third century or whatever. How could it predict the future? You'd have to say that somebody from the second or third century was still given a, a dispensation. You know what I'm saying? So it doesn't even matter, you know, but it still it turns out to be true, regardless of where you put it in time. So it doesn't even matter. So it's finally, fell, finally, again, at the very last stage of this, because that's what finally means, others fell on good soil, which is their hearts, and it produced fruit upward towards heaven, which is what this other one did fail to do. They didn't rise towards heaven, so they didn't reach the heavenly level meaning, and the last ones did, right? And again, some 60 times and some 120. Now, I would say that the 60 times, in this particular instance, if you just take the root, the base of it, which is six, that would have to do with the age. So I think that this other one, which is 120, is twice this. 
So it's like saying that this is the age of flesh and this is twice that. In other words, it's as if it were everything you know, and then it transforms into something else. And now I know twice what you know. I know a whole other level than what you know. So you bring it forth 120 times as compared to the 60 times. So you have knowledge that transcends the age, right? Um, and then he says, I've cast fire on the world. So he's giving them teachings before he gives them the answer. He's trying to give them the answer based on what they need to know to understand the answer, right? So he says, I've cast fire upon the world and I'm guarding it until it blazes. Uh, because again, what is the world? He's going to destroy it. Why? And with what? Well, with the, the fire. You know, God is an all-consuming fire, the fire of judgment. He, this is the trial. This is a testing. And it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna blaze. It's going to destroy everything that is in the world, that's based on the world. That's the six thousand years which are gone. Um, this heaven will disappear again. The birds of heaven, right? That was that was Judaism. Uh, I'm sorry. This the, the current one was Christianity, or the uh, he's talking about the age that currently is, and then as being a heaven, as being metaphorical, and the and the one above it will disappear because again the birds of heaven, right? In other words, what stands between you and the heavenly, right? Um, what what alters your view of the heavenly in other words that that lower level meaning so those two layers are going to be gone those who are dead aren't alive and he always speaks of the dead as being those who um who don't know the mystery who aren't living who who again uh whoever discovers the meaning of these sayings won't taste of death so not knowing what these sayings means in other words is death that's spiritual death because you only understand it on the flesh and so it all sounds stupid to you. Oh, what does he mean eating a lion? You know, or what does he mean taking off your clothes? Whatever. He doesn't understand it's spiritual. You know, so the carnal man doesn't understand it. And he says, um, those who are living won't die. Why? Because you, it's the same reason you can't unsee something. Like if you're following what I'm saying, you cannot unsee this. So you won't die. You're never going to fall back into that illusion because you see it. And it says, in the days when you ate what was dead, you made it alive. In other words, the way in which the, the scripture spoke of the first coming, the coming of the suffering servant. They were able to, to read those scriptures in the sense of, of their fulfillment because they understood the Psalms and the prophets that spoke of the suffering servant uh, and also of his resurrection. And it says, now when you're in the light, and again, this is knowledge as compared to darkness, which is benightedness, right? Um, what will you do? Well, you can't do anything, right? So in other words, you're, you're helpless, right? On the day when you were one, you became divided. You know, in other words, you you took this this unitary knowledge, which was the keys, which was the truth that applied all the way across the scriptures. You could read Enoch, you could read the Gospel of Thomas, you could read all this stuff and understand it. And you had that oneness, you had that that unity, you had the unitary knowledge. And it goes, it speaks of this extensively in the Gospel of Truth about the unity, the the the, the unity, the unitary knowledge. Uh, on the day when you were one, you became two, or you became divided. Why? Because there was separation between you and and God. Um, and why? Because, um, yeah, because it is inside of you and it is outside of you. Your inside and your outside are the same. You're, you're, that you were put into a physical world by, by a power and a knowledge and an ability, uh, that transcends time and power and space. And so does your soul. So what's the difference? It's all by the same hand. It's all by the same heart. It's all by the same mind, you and your world. So there's no difference. They don't know that, right? So he's trying to explain to them, you're going to be divided. You're going to think in terms of happenstance. You're going to think in terms of speculation because you lost that unitary knowledge. You've lost the oneness. But when you become two or when you, be divide, you are divided, what are you going to do, right? Uh, and so then they ask him, okay, well, we know then that you're going to leave us. Who will then lead us, right? Um, and again, they're, they're acknowledging that because they're divided, they're going to need leadership. So he tells them where to go. It says, wherever you are, you will go to James the just for whom heaven and earth came into being. So let's look at it. The heavenly and the earthly are obvious to him. Those are the two, right? And they came into being for him because the one who has the two has the one because they understand both. They have ears to hear. They have eyes to see. They have the earthly and the spiritual. So he has the heavenly and the earthly. And why is it James the just? Because again, even though James the just technically was not James the son of Zebedee, this was a different James. This was Jesus's brother. But the idea is that the names, there's a connection between, between names. Like, for example, at the time of uh, his crucifixion, there was this other guy named Barabbas. And in um, one of the Gospels, it actually says Jesus Barabbas. Jesus, the son of the father. And you can look that up. Um, very interesting that it actually has, he actually has the same first name. Um, because, again, there's a connection. 
a lot of times a Mary is a Mary is a Mary is a Mary and a James is a James is a James and a John is a John and a John. Uh, you know, John, what's the connection between John the Baptist and John the Evangelist, right? Again, if he should remain until I come, what is that to you, right? In other words, if, if we didn't go into the, the, the significance of the transfiguration, um, but it might be worth touching on just to kind of explain this point. But the idea is that a, that a James is a James is a James. And for this, you know, Barnabas says this too. When he talked about how you should, had Joshua what followed Moses because God takes the time to put things in, in that level of precision. So he actually says, look, this is, you take it as an article of faith that, that, that Joshua and Yeshua are the same name, right? The idea is that because Joshua followed Moses in the physical sense, what's going to follow the Old Testament is the New Testament. And what's going to follow the lawgiver is the Messiah, right? So there, there's a connection. So the idea here is that James represents Judaism, because again, if you take into the, 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 one of the corresponding, because there are a lot of things that come in threes. That's another one of those videos I put out in 2000, that good things come in threes. It was the idea that, okay, just like you had the tables of the law, and, which corresponded to the law of Moses, that's the first dispensation in the box of covenants, and that the Aaron's rod which budded and bore fruit is the same thing as the New Testament bearing fruit because it bears fruit when you understand it. And at that point, that's the overcoming, in other words. And at that point, you get to eat of the hidden manna, which is the third dispensation. And what was the significance of the manna? Again, it was gathered on the sixth day, just like these volumes were gathered up into the sixth millennium. Like all these books and stuff is the gathering of all this heavenly manna, this heavenly food, this food that comes down from heaven, which is these apocryphal books and these, these other sources that are gathered and that they are consumed on the seventh day, which is the true Sabbath. That is to say that we're not given a fresh dispensation of scripture on the seventh day. We're given what came before, which is old scripture, which is what this stuff is. It's old. And so we're given to eat of it on the Sabbath day, which is the true food. Right. So the idea is that that when when Yeshua says in Revelation that him that overcometh, I will give to the eat of the hidden manna. Right. That's a that's a testament that's coming. Right. So that's a future thing. So there is there's what is there's what was and there's what is to come. Right. There's this heaven and the one above that, you know, and that which is to come, et cetera. It's, it's the idea that that it was um, the that there's this 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 three dispensations, if you will, of the scripture. So at the transfiguration, for example. Um, you had um, Jesus and Moses and Elijah. Um, and then you had down below, you had Peter and James and John. Again, James has the same name. James the Zebedee has the same name as James the Just. Um, and that, like, for example, when, when he was on his way through to Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And some said you're Moses or one of the prophets come back to life, uh, you know, or that you're Elijah or Jeremiah or some other prophet that's come back to life. Um, anyway. Um, and, he, and he says to Simon Peter, he says, but who do you say that I am? And he says, well, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, right? So the idea is he understood that distinction between living and dead. And he says, well, blessed art thou, knowing that he mentioned the word living God, right? Because he understood that spiritual thing. So, well, blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of John, right? In other words, he's going to be born again through the acts of whatever John does. And we'll get to that. The idea is that thou art blessed, Simon Bar-Jonah, right? Because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you right? So that's the dead, right? But my father, which is in heaven, which is the living, right? And he says that, um, and um, I say that, um, that, uh, that thou art Peter, or you are rock, and upon this rock, I will build my church, right? So he associates um, Peter with the church. So you, when you see Peter, he symbolizes the church. So you can read that as a parable. When you see uh, the interaction between Peter and, and Yeshua, you see it as the church versus the Christ, uh, and so here you have this, um, this line that you could draw between Peter and, and Jesus or Yeshua in that imagery, because, um, because him and his exalted form or whatever, um, corresponds with Yeshua and I mean with Peter and there's a couple of things. Um, he says that, um, about Elijah, the, the question is that people said, well, you know, Elijah must first come before the Messiah does. And he says to the people, he says, but the, the the um john has already come uh, elijah has already come i mean but speaking of john the baptist and they did whatever they wanted to to him right so in other words whoever comes in the future right but he says that he will come right so so how do you rectify he has come and he's dead but he will come so the, the second john which is to come in other words the second elijah which is to come corresponds with john who is also to come because again when when at the end of the gospel of john you have this conflict between peter and john where Yeshua tells Peter, he says, um, you know, uh, he tells him about the death that he is going to, uh, 
to endure and he's going to suffer, meaning his spiritual death, the spiritual death of the age. But in physicality, he was going to suffer. He was going to be crucified, I guess, according to tradition, he was crucified upside down. Um, and so that was his, uh, that was his uh, fate. And even now you see, I don't want to get too much into it, but you see a lot of upside down crosses and stuff in the satanic That's church. That's interesting. I never thought of that parallel. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much longer we're going to go because we're obviously going to, we could go all night long talking about this. Um, yeah. It's crazy because I know you were just talking about the uh, who do you say that I am and then in Thomas as well. And he says, I am unable to even speak about how glorifying you are. You know, like it's it's interesting how it repeats through different books. Like what you've laid out tonight, I think is is such a good introduction. Like it's funny when you say again, your toes wet. So I've been studying your uh, books and what you've been breaking down for almost 10 years, not quite. And I, I got to tell everybody, it's totally possible for anyone to do it. If I can do it, I, I know you can. But it's interesting how you keep repeating that it's a process that, like you had said with Joshua through Moses, it's a process of time that it just takes. And you will figure it all out. You will be given the answers. And like, I guess if you wanted to make some last points, I hope you'll join us again. And then maybe at some point you said you might maybe do live streams. I'd just like you to keep as active as you can with sharing this because we want to shout, shout it from our rooftops. And it's interesting, all the work that... Um, that we've done really been laying down and you had said earlier to gain uh, heavenly uh i guess riches you said put stuff down and if it's censored and hidden for a later date that's a sign you said of of, of greater things to come and i feel like a lot of your work as well has been you know it, it could be a lot more shared and, and a lot more people reach like you said the breakthrough moment i hope we are somehow a part of that breakthrough i don't know if jason had anything to to add in here he's been awfully quiet tonight but we both have just been you said some amazing things, the unveiling of a new holy priesthood, and that right there totally perked up my spirit. Um, all these things, I think whoever's in here tonight, please, we all need to listen to this hangout again and again, and then we need to have Robert come back and we need to get into this even deeper, because I, like you said, it could be a week, it could be a month, like, I'd like to go to this new place, I'm ready. Jason, do you want to add? Uh, it's, it's been fantastic. Uh, Robert, you, you know this material so well, and uh, it just sort of flows out of you. And um, we hope to have you back for more of this. Well, yeah, I've had a lot of time to think about it. I'll put it that way. But, that, you know, it, it's 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 what needs to happen. I mean, I, see, again, I don't know about what the timing is. I feel like I need a lot of years to process a lot of this stuff. And so a lot of this delay might just be an accounting that's taken in for how long it's going to take me to develop to the point where I can articulate to a certain extent. You know, but that's one side of the equation. You know, I, I think that everything is timing. There, there's Kronos and there's Kairos. You know, Kronos is like, you know, the actual time on a clock and Kairos is more like timing, right? Things are gonna come together at some point into a critical mass and that this is going to shift the paradigm. How suddenly that happens, how long that happens, um, it's written in the tables of heaven. Um, it's not necessarily disclosed to us in so many words, it's probably there, but like so many things, it's hidden under a veil. Uh, and I feel like God will be vindicated no matter what, because of the very fact that he's demonstrated his power. And so those who come to know the truth also come to realize his power uh, and come to, in some ways, because of his will that we do this, we come into possession of some of that power. Because again, if we ask things according to his will, he will do it. If we ask things according to our will, you know, then who knows? But he gives us things that we didn't know what to ask for. Like even down here where it says, I will give you what no eye has ever seen or ear has ever heard or hand has ever touched and no human mind has ever thought. So he distinguishes between human mind and spiritual mind, a human eye and a spiritual eye, uh, a human ear and a spiritual ear. And according to your acts, according to your deeds, you know, uh, this has never been written out in so many words in all of history. No hand has literally touched this. Um, and so it is a fulfillment of all of those things. Um, everything that you see written in this book in some way comes back to that initial thought that, that this is the fire that comes out. And it, you could just land on anything almost at random in this book where there are three, there are, there are, they are divine. Uh, where there are two or one, I am with them. You know, the idea is where there are three deities. That is to say, we speak of the God of the old Testament. We speak of the God of the new Testament. For example, a person might, uh, only uh, see uh, the one dispensation. Another person might recognize two dispensations. But when you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the, the, the dispensation of the Father, which is the Old Testament, the dispensation of the Son, which is the New, and the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, which is the Third, you see what I'm saying? Then they are divine because why? Because of the same thing I said before. When you when you come to recognize His mystery, 
you, and his mystery is his will, and you become aligned with his will and his mystery, then again, you are in touch with the divine. You know, uh, no prophet is welcome in their own village. No doctor heals those who know them. If he is the great physician, then why did the Christians not know him? Why, when he was in their own village? You know what I'm saying? You just every single one of these things that you land on, if you know that secret, if you know that which is hidden, then you have the power to, as it states, uh, you have the power to reign over the all. And the Greek version actually says, and he who reigns will rest. In other words, your searching will come to a stop because you will have found. You shouldn't stop. In other words, there is movement. It's searching, right? Yeah, and the, it, it doesn't and the, ex it doesn't escape me that there's three of us that are in, in a deep dive on this <laughs> and, and trying to share it with others, right? Well, I mean, again, there's a, there's the physical and there's the the spiritual. Yeah. I think where there's two or three witnesses uh, of things, then he says, well, there were you know two or three. I'm in the midst of them, you know, um, which is to say he is the third, you know, or he embodies them all, you know. But that being said. Um, it, it, I, I think it has a lot to do with the, um, the idea that, that, well, people who believe in only the old Testament, let's say people who are Jewish, they see the God of Judaism, so to speak, as it's put in common parlance, which, you know, I speak typically in common parlance because I'm speaking to everybody in the world and I'm not speaking to people with specialized knowledge. And I'm not trying to argue things that I either don't want to spend a ton of time talking about or don't have the means to explain to my own satisfaction and therefore not to theirs. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I stick to what I know, you know, and as far as that's concerned, people speak colloquially of the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament. I think this is what that generally means, that there were three dispensations, again, one of the Father, one of the Son, and one of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is one of those things that's talked about in the future, like John, John being the one that corresponds with Elijah, like, like in, the, um, in the Transfiguration, because John is to remain until he comes, and Elijah will come and restore all things. So that by default leaves um, Moses and James as corresponding with one another, for example, which was to the point I was trying to make earlier, James the just would be the just just uh, Jews, Judaism, um, with the right, if you will, um, view of the heavenly and the earthly. In other words, the first revelation completely understood. Um, and that's where the disciples, which were the second generation, were supposed to go because James representing the Jews. Uh, and again, being the brother of Yeshua, just like Jude. Um, living in his home, presumably, uh, or at least living in close, close um, contact with him. However, that was, we're not giving the details, but be that as it may, this is his brother, you know, in, in, in terms of uh, the bio, the bio, his biographical details. Um, so, you know, the idea uh, here is that, that, um, that true Judaism, if you will, um, does encompass the heavenly and the earthly. And so would true Christianity. That is to say the apostles uh, who are worried about him leading them. Right. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice too. But that being said, um, you know, it, it, it's it's a little bit on the abstruse side sometimes. But overall, the general idea, it, the sense that you can get, is if you just keep applying the same template, you're you're able to unravel virtually every one of these riddles. Um, you know, you see the one who wasn't born of a woman uh, again, because the fleshly son is one which is born of a woman, but the spiritual son is one which is born, if you will, of the Holy Spirit which is that third dispensation, which is the knowledge of the living versus the dead. Uh, and he talks about, you know, my, again, in the same context of the man born, you know, not a woman, he speaks also um, um, of uh, the, uh, my mother gave me uh, death, uh, but my true mother gave me life. You see what I'm saying? So these, these things riff off of one another, you know, so it's, it's, it, it, it's just like I said, it just keeps going around and around in circles, but in a way, the simplicity of it um, is the proof of it. Because because if it's just kind of the same thing over and over again, yeah, you could probably say, well, that's pretty that's pretty uh, repetitive or that's pretty, you know, but it's it's really revelatory. Mm -hmm. It really is because you see so many different aspects of the same thing being said and the way in which it goes around and around and around and around on itself is just that much more reassurance of the all pervasive nature. And like you said before, it's it's a little bit holographic. The scriptures are a bit holographic. There's seeds and, and images of one thing here, there and everywhere. Uh, it's in amazing. One fashion. And it's amazing how you've really broke it down. So I guess what right there, we do want to have you back. We were at Logan 16, but you're sort of riffing through here. I know you have so much more to share, but I guess there's a few people that have to work. But um, I'd like to come back to this and have you back on because really, I'm so enlightened and I, it's the best ever well, for me. <laughs> you'll, you'll, well, that's that's the that's what this book is for. That's why I was saying starting with this book again, because this is a book of keys and a book of riddles. 
because it lies outside of the canon, it makes it a very interesting problem for traditional Christianity, because now if you're able to explain it, and let's say there's enough of us out there who are willing to get in their, you know, business about it a little bit, you know, and confront them with this. I mean, I'm not saying you got to be, you know, beat them over the head with it. You know, I'm not saying you got to block the freeway with this. You know what I'm saying? But I mean, if you do this the right way and in the godly way, you know what I'm saying? Uh, we can be sort of activistic um, and make this happen. Um, there's different places where it says, you know, in, in, in the Shepherd of Hermits, it literally says, I will force them to believe. You know what I'm saying? There are things where it literally says it's going to be forceful and emphatic. Um, and so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really banking on that to be true because, again, if you get the first taste of this, you know that, that it's good. This is, a, you know, this is something where you just recognize it and you continue to recognize it and it dilates upon itself. Well, the, infinitely. the secret gospel of Peter, or the apocryphal of Peter, wasn't the, the man that discovered it forced by the angel? He beat him until he would break open the floor to discover the book in the box? Oh, yeah. You mean um, the Apocalypse of Peter? Yeah. yeah. Well, and, you know, there's a similar story, I guess, in the Apocalypse of Paul, too. Um, but again, this is one of those tricky issues because, see, there's a lot of ways to get derailed on the subject. And I'm not saying that that's one of them. But one of the one of the things about it is I, I try only to speak to the parabolic because it's a little I don't ever deny the fleshly aspect of it. Like, I feel like there, the fleshly aspect is I, I put it this way. It's like the glory and then there's the surpassing glory. The surpassing glory is that which is meant by that which is glorious, or that which is presaged by that. In other words, when it, they talk about the law being shadows of things to come and not the things themselves, mm -hmm. um, the idea is that that um, that even the reality of things um, is still, however real they are, they are still shadows of things to come. Like, I don't question his physical appearance on earth, and I don't question his physical death, and I don't question his metaphorical or his, his actual resurrection. But it also points, but the reason why he physically came back alive was because he lived as a parable of the logos. And so the logos, or the true meaning, or the understanding of the word, in other words, the face-to-face, -face, the eye-to-eye, -eye, the, you know, I'm absolutely with you on the same page, exactly where you are, you know, I'm reading you exactly what you're saying, that, that sort of... Um, that that's sort of uh, um, that that sort of transcendent understanding is what is paramount. In other words, the physical came about because of that. The physical had to be carried out. Um, and, and again, um, where is the quote? And again, we could go on about this, um, but there's a, a specific quote in here about um, us living in poverty. Um, you know that that um, yeah that he is amazed that we that if uh, if spirit comes into being. Yeah, yeah. Um, the spirit came into being because of the, the flesh. That is a wonder. But if the um, if, if the flesh came into being because of the spirit, sorry, that is a wonder. But if the spirit came into being because of the flesh, that is a wonder of wonders. And what he's actually saying there is that um, that the reason why the flesh came down was because again he talked about how Jesus had to take on that book. That um, this is spoken of in um, the, the Gospel of Truth. That there, when he was in heaven, when he was um, when he was at the right hand of the Father before he came down, it was written in the book that he would come, right? And so he had to come down and take on that book and live that book and live that parable because he was living it as a parable, if you will, in the flesh, but of the logos. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God. Um, and as a matter of fact, you can, and this is a whole other story, but you can actually take that idea and go plug it back into Genesis. And just read the whole creation story um, as a um, in the beginning, God created the heavenly and the earthly level meanings, right? Mm -hmm. And etc. So you just read it like that because you're constrained to. That's the other thing too. You you are under a certain constraint to be consistent, and so a lot of these things bear themselves out because they're algebraic and almost formulaic. They you you use them over here like this, and you have to be consistent. And so by forcing you to be consistent, your eyes get open to everything everywhere. Because you're having to see it on that heavenly level, and so um, yeah, yeah. How is I? So as he as as he being the word and the parable of it, he was put to, be, to death, and so was the mystery. But then it rolls back to life, just as he has. And it says that explicitly, by the way. That was one of those weird things too that I that I, I was talking about the predictive thing. Like if I know something, I should be able to see it over here, and I should be able to see it over there. I do a lot of that in the guidebook for the elect. Anybody starting out should really read the guidebook for the elect. I put it in, and then probably this, the, the gospel. Chat. I put that in the that. chat as well. 
Anyone... It's it's very useful because it's just like six little treatises that that I wrote, but those were the, the things that were sort of a formative things that I that I that I started that were the impetus for me proceeding and 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 trying to to flesh everything else out because it just sort of gave me the green light and the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Um, you know, and, and I had this very deep realization that this was really a real thing and that this was really happening and that it wasn't some delusion of mine or that no, it was yeah. you know, very real, you know, and so um, but again, that being said, um, yeah, there's, 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 there's no end to this. Like, even like John says, there's no end. There's <laughs> it's, just no it's, end. It's infinite. On and on and on it's about infinite. It. Yeah. Um, but that's the strength of it. Because again, once you catch on, you don't really need other people. You can work it all out. Like I said, if you have something in your hand, more will be given to you. And I, I feel like that has borne itself out in my life and my experience. And absolutely, you know, nothing special about me. It would bear itself out in anybody else's life and anybody else's experience. You know what I'm saying? It's there for everybody. It's there for the world. He came to save us all. It manifests you know, as you search, right? It comes alive as you search for it. And it's guaranteed, like it said in the book well, of you Thomas. Come alive. You come alive. That's yeah. the thing. Um, <laughs> the words will come to you. The the thoughts will come to you. The realizations will come to you. And as you, and the thing about it is um, you got to give. You've got to work. Put your – if you don't do anything else, put your hand to the plow. Just Amen. do something. That, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to be the spearhead of anything. I want to be a catalyst. I want to be an influencer. That's my – you know, I want to be able to point the way and get the thing rolling. You know what I'm saying? But there's nobody spearheading this whole thing. It's a spiritual movement. Mm -hmm. It is egalitarian in the sense that that he will use anybody, uh, anybody who's willing to work. Like even at the the parable, you know, he's like, go out to the ends of the street and find anybody, anybody. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So it's really easy to get over yourself when you realize you're not anybody, you're nobody, and you were invited basically out. I hate to say it, as an act of spite. For those people who rejected the invitation, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean I'm not going to come. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes, I'm, I'm in. I'm, I'm in. What kind of shirt do you have you know? for me, Father? <laughs> right? This one, I'll take this one off right away. But that's but that's how we all should see it. <laughs> so yeah, we're we're the stragglers and the nobodies at the ends of the road. But so what? You know, the master calls you go. Yeah. That's what differentiates you from those who did it. I think we're going to end it on that. I I don't think you could end it on anything better. So you know, thank you so much, Robert. Thank you, everyone in the chat. You've totally blessed everyone tonight. Uh, go ahead, Jason. You can finish it off. And we'll have Robert uh, back as soon as he's ready. Yeah, it's been a fantastic night. Uh, we usually, you know, on our spiritual Sundays, have like a little bit smaller audience because more people are concerned about like, you know, everyday truth or type stuff more than the scriptures. But tonight, um, we've had a little bit larger audience and I could tell in the chat that a lot of people were edified. So something was going on. Um, looking forward to having you back, Robert. And I do think that we probably will be live again this Wednesday on um, a more of like the, the current affairs. So thank you again and look forward to seeing all of you in the chat again real soon. All right, well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Robert, and thank everyone else. Uh, we wanna see everyone again. Please share this as much as you can. It's totally free for everyone.